Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Honorable Chief Guest, Respected Chair of the Session, Respected Director General of BIISS, Distinguished Guest, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum and a very good morning. I am Sajid Karim, one of the researchers of this institute. On behalf of Bangladesh Institute of International and Strategic Studies, I would like to welcome you all to this Research Colloquium 2022. Today, we are extremely honored and privileged to have Amongst us, His Excellency Dr. A. K. Abdul Momin MP, Honorable Foreign Minister, Government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh, as the Chief Guest. Respected audience, today's program is divided into three sessions. The first session will begin with the welcome address by Major General Sheikh Pasha Habibuddin, OSP, SGP, BAMS, AFWC, PSC, Director General, BIISS. Afterwards, three presentations will be made by BIS researchers which will be followed by an open discussion session. Thereafter, the honorable chief guest of today's seminar will give his valuable remarks. This session will be chaired by Ambassador Kaji Imtiaj Hossein, PAA, Chairman BIISS. May I now request the chair of the session to kindly commence the program. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Honorable Chief Guest, His Excellency Dr. A.K. Abdul Momin, MP, Honorable Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Bangladesh, Major General Sheikh Pasha Habibuddin, Director General of BIS, Distinguished Guests, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to all of you uh, at today's uh, research colloquium. And uh, it is my great pleasure and honor to extend a very warm welcome to the Honorable Foreign Minister who has been very, very kind uh, to join us in this year and uh, seminar at our institute. We will be having three sessions today, as uh, Sajid had already said, and, and we are honored and, and thankful to uh, General Mubin to be a chair of one of the sessions. Uh, another session will be chaired by uh, Professor Imtiaz uh, Ahmed uh, later uh, in the afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank you all uh, for having uh, joined us in this uh, colloquium, both in person who are here and, and those who have joined us uh, virtually. Uh, in this uh, great month of December, uh, we celebrate our victory. It's a momentous occasion for any nation. And it's also a time to pay our deepest homage and tribute to the father of the nation. And I start with uh, paying my personal homage uh, to the greatest Bengali of all time, father of the nation, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. I pay my tribute to the three million martyrs and 200,000, over 200,000 girls and women who made supreme sacrifice. 15th August, the, the nation lost a large number of people from the family of the father of the nation. I pray for the departed soul and pay our uh, homage and, and respect to them. 
Uh, before I uh, proceed further, may I request our director, General, General Major General Sheikh Pasha Habibuddin, kindly make his welcome remarks. General Pasha. Bismillah rahman rahim Respected Chief Guest, Dr. A.K. Abdul Momen, MP, Honorable Foreign Minister, Government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh. Respected Chairman of this, Ambassador Kazi M.T. Hassan, PA, former Chief of Army Staff, Bangladesh Army, and former Director General of this, General Mohammed Abdul Mubin, SBP, NDC, PSC, retired. Excellencies, learned session chairs, distinguished participants, speakers, dear media representatives, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum. On behalf of the Bangladesh Institute of International and Strategic Studies, let me extend my warm welcome to all of you to the Institute's first. Research Colloquium. I take the honor to express my heartfelt gratitude to Dr. A.K. Abdul Momen MP, Honorable Foreign Minister, for his gracious presence in today's event as the Chief Guest. At the outset, I would like to pay my solemn reverence to the memory of our Father of the Nation, greatest Bengali of all times, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. On the occasion of our 52nd Victory Day, I extend my sincere homage to the memory of three million martyrs who made their supreme sacrifice and to lack women who were abused and tortured during our war of liberation in 1971. Ladies and gentlemen, Bangladesh Institute of International and Strategic Studies is a statutory institution established by the government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh in 1978 with the aim of undertaking and promoting research on international affairs, security, and strategic affairs. Every year, this undertakes independent and collaborative research on a wide range of topics. In the year 2022, this conducted its research activities based on three broad themes. The first theme was foreign policy and global outbreaks. Under this theme, there were four sub-themes, namely Bangladesh's foreign policy future outlook, regional cooperation, multilateralism, and outreach in emerging regions. The second theme was security and strategic affairs, where there were five sub-themes, namely defense policy analysis, Rohingya issues, terrorism and counterterrorism, cybersecurity, and peace building. Diplomacy and negotiations was the third theme, and the sub-themes were environmental and hydro diplomacy, climate negotiation, and trade and investment negotiations. Under these three themes, 31 individual research projects were selected for the calendar year 2022, of which 26 are either completed or near completion. And we have carried forward five for the next year's research plan. To accomplish the individual and group research projects, this organized in-house seminars for proposal and paper presentation throughout the year. For professional skill development, BIISS also organized workshops for its faculty members on research methodology, editing, and referencing. Besides, this organized monthly researchers meet for its researchers every single month in order to stay abreast of the most significant events taking place on national and international arenas. Planet guests, as part of disseminating knowledge, this also organized 10 hybrid seminars and two eminent person lectures in 2022. Besides, the Institute organized four roundtable discussions and interactive sessions on uh, with Ms. Uh, 
Mitchell, Mitchell uh, Bislett, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Like the previous years, the calendar year 2022, this published all issues of its quarterly journals. Besides, we regularly publish books, this papers, and seminar proceedings. In 2022, we published one book named Glimpses of Bangladesh, a BIS paper titled Repatriation of Forcibly Displaced Myanmar Nationals, Political Security and Humanitarian Assistance, and nine seminar proceedings. With a view to enhance our exposure nationally and internationally, for the first time, BIS is going to participate in Ecuche Book Fair at Bangla Academy next year. I'm sure this will extend our reach to wider segment of readers and acquaint the visitors with our research activities. Distinguished participants. The colloquium for which we have assembled today will represent our selected work that we have successfully completed during this calendar year. In light of our three selected themes for the year 2022, we have designed three sessions for today. The selected presentations in each session will shed light on the important aspects pertinent to Bangladesh's foreign policy and its outreach, security, diplomacy, and negotiations. With the distinguished session chairs and presenters from this research faculty, I'm quite sanguine that today's insightful deliberations will generate much interest among the policymakers. As we have ahead of us an exciting lineup of presentations, I believe we can learn from the works and discussions. Finally, again, I express my sincerest gratitude to the honorable chief guest, presenters, session chairs, and the learned audience for encouraging us with your kind participation. I expect each of the sessions in today's colloquium will generate productive discussions and exchange of valuable ideas to serve the greater interest of Bangladesh, especially in the areas of foreign policy, security, and strategic affairs. Thank you very much to all of you. Joy Bangla. Thank you, Director General, for your detailed uh, briefing, I would say, um, uh, of uh, the uh, very extensive activities that uh, the Institute has taken over uh, the period of 2022. And 2022 had been a, a very challenging year globally, especially in the context of the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, which had uh, uh, overlapped in 2021, 20, and uh, uh, to a large extent into uh, 2022. But uh, the, uh, uh, the way that we have as an institute uh, cope with this challenge uh, is also very remarkable. The uh, work that has been undertaken by our faculties uh, uh, certainly uh, of, of clearly reflects uh, the, uh, the, the, the focus that this institute is supposed to have. Uh, we will now have three presentations, and these presentations are based on the studies and the researches undertaken by our fa faculty. Uh, we'll start with a presentation by Motu Sri Islam, uh, who will uh, cover Bangladesh and Indian Ocean Rim Association, Iora, future dynamics and role of uh, Bangladesh. Uh, Motu Sri, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor. Uh, honorable Chief Guest, respected Chair of the Session, respected Director General, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to all of you. I'm honored and uh, delighted to present uh, my paper in front of uh, Honorable Chief Guest and uh, the distinguished guests today. I'm here to present my research paper, as you can see from the title, 
Bangladesh and the Indian Ocean Dream Association, the future dynamics and the role of Bangladesh. As you may all know that uh, for the very first time, Bangladesh has assumed the chairmanship of AURA uh, since 2021 November. And uh, when we enter uh, the IRA's official website, you will come across this wonderful uh, logo which shows Bangladesh's flag along with its uh, uh, theme uh, of its chairmanship, which is harnessing the opportunities of the Indian Ocean sustainably for inclusive development. Ladies and gentlemen, the key research questions that my paper addresses are first, what are the opportunities IRA provides for Bangladesh? Second, what are the constraints that will determine the future dynamics? And finally, how to make Bangladesh's role effective in IRA? So my presentation outline looks like this. I'll start with what is IRA, then I'll move into Bangladesh in IRA. Next, I'll talk about the opportunities, then I'll briefly identify the challenges and the policy options for Bangladesh followed by a concluding remarks. So before going to the main findings, ladies and gentlemen, let me just give you a brief overview of IRA. Nelson Mandela pushed the idea of the establishment of a regional organization back in 1995 that led to the establishment of IRA's predecessor, the Indian Ocean Ream Association for Regional Cooperation, which is IORARC, on March 7, 1997. Although the initial enthusiasm, IRA underperformed as a platform to produce uh, enhancing the regional cooperation and the main reason was the lack of strong leadership. But the scenarios changed since the uh, 2010, ladies and gentlemen, the increasing strategic and political attention to the Indian Ocean, the advent of Indo-Pacific and the emerging challenges has pushed the IRA back into the limelight. Since 2011, the IRA has been to a revitalization process when India, Australia, Indonesia, and South Africa took the chairmanship of the organization. And during this time, IRA was able to identify six priority areas of cooperation and two cross-cutting focus areas, as you can see from the slides. IRA not only depends in its priority areas, but also has widened in terms of its membership. IRA's founding membership of 14 states had expanded to 23. IRA has now 10 dialogue partners, including China, Egypt, Germany, Italy, Japan, Turkey, Republic of Korea, Russia, UK, and US. And you can see the inclusion of Russia as dialogue partner in 2021 has completed all the P5 members in IRA. Let me talk a bit about the structure of the organization. The Council of Ministers, which is COM, comprised the foreign ministers, constitutes the highest decision-making body and meets annually. However, the Committee of Senior Officials which is CSO oversees the overall function of the association. The cooperation is also facilitated through various substructure, including the Indian Ocean Dream Academic Group, Indian Ocean Dream Business Forum, and various working groups, as you can see from the slides. So what about Bangladesh in IORA? Looking back, uh, Bangladesh has been actively participating in all IORA arrangements since 1999, when it became the member of IORARC. However, the significance of the organization was realized following the demarcation of its maritime boundary when maritime security and blue economy became important priority areas for Bangladesh. And a major policy deliberation, ladies and gentlemen, on maritime cooperation was reflected in the speech of the Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina when she attended IRA's first ever leader summit in 2017. And uh, she urged the IRA's leaders to promote maritime cooperation for a peaceful and prosperous Indian Ocean region. In 2019, Bangladesh was officially designated as IRA vice chairman. And in 2021, on the occasion of assuming the chairmanship of IRA, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina called upon IRA member states to make the best efforts to develop blue economies. So what is the role of the chair? The role of the chair is to arrange, host, coordinate, and preside over the meetings. Besides, the chair also plays a leading role in agenda setting and consensus building within IRA. IRA has one special system named Troika, consists of the chair, the vice chair, and the previous chair, which which gives the policy direction to the organization. So therefore, Bangladesh will remain in Troika and part of the leadership up to 2025. 
So why am I saying Bangladesh can play a significant role in Ayurveda, ladies and gentlemen? There is an increasing number of scholars uh, that highlights Bangladesh's rising economic and diplomatic profile in the international area. Look at Bangladesh's economic success, which has led scholars to identify it Bangladesh miracle, Bangladesh surprise. Bangladesh is also considered an important actor due to its geopolitical position. It has contributed greatly to global peace, security through the UN peacekeeping missions. Besides, Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh's successful chairmanship of the Climate Vulnerable Forum has showed us, yes, we can lead as well. So my paper argues that Bangladesh's rising international profile has created an opportunity to play a bigger role in Ayurveda, ladies and gentlemen. Let us now move into the opportunities Ayurveda provides for Bangladesh. The first is the geostrategic opportunity. Uh, from a geostrategic perspective, the Indian Ocean is highly potential ground for power politics. And here, multilateralism can be an effective strategy for Bangladesh to minimize the challenges emerging from the new uh, geopolitical order in the Indo-Pacific region. And institutions like Ayura, ladies and gentlemen, bears significance here. One important point here I want to highlight is the presence of most of the prominent actors of the Indo-Pacific in Ayura either as member states or dialogue partners. And during Bangladesh's chairmanship in the past year, Ayura has adopted Ayura's outlook on the Indo-Pacific. And uh, in the action plan, uh, it has emphasized ensuring freedom of navigation in accordance with international law, including UNCLOS. And it has also initiated uh, the guidelines for strategic management and criteria for dialogue partners, which is expected to pave the way for cooperation with the support of the dialogue partners. So if Bangladesh is able to bridge the gap between the member countries, then it is possible to have a broader cooperation, ladies and gentlemen. The second is the increasing economic interest. Bangladesh has been strengthening bilateral economic ties with major countries of Indian Ocean. As you can see from the table, Bangladesh's trade with the major ring countries numbered only 40 million back in 1995, which has increased to 27 billion in 2021. Although it is a challenging uh, uh, to have a greater uh, regionalism and economic integration in the current scenario, however, Bangladesh can take the advantage of IRA forums like Indian Ocean Rim Business Forum, which is working as a platform to expanding cooperation with the business community. One opportunity here for Bangladesh is the election of Sheikh Fazle Fahim, a former president of FBCCI, as a chairman of IORBF. And during its chairmanship, Bangladesh has already undertaken a range of activities to reinvigorate IORBF. Just in the previous month, we have seen IORBF has successfully, for the very first time, um, hosted a first ever leadership summit in Dhaka. Bangladesh can also use the opportunity to promote blue economy and make the themes of blue economy at the center of IORA activity, ladies and gentlemen. And Bangladesh is playing a key role in this regard. When Bangladesh was vice chair back in 2019, it hosted the third ministerial conference on blue economy, which resulted into the Dhaka Declaration on Blue Economy. And in 2020, we have seen uh, the International Seabed Authority and IRA signed an MOU to expand col collaboration in marine scientific research and deep seabed exploration. Finally, I would like to highlight the emerging security issues as well, uh, like climate change. Uh, uh, Bangladesh has proposed to include climate change as a cost-cutting issue of IRA during the 22nd form. And uh, strategic framework of action on main debris in the Indian Ocean, which is scheduled to be adopted in 2030, 2023, during Bangladesh's chairmanship, ladies and gentlemen. So if I can highlight some of the achievements of Bangladesh in IRA so far, the first would be the formulation of the second IRA action plan, which has clear strategic objectives for each priority area with a specific time frame divided into short term, medium term, and long term goals. We have seen Bangladesh's agenda setting effort in the 22nd COM when Bangladesh has proposed to include climate change as cost cutting issue of IRA. The IRA Development Initiative, which can be the funding arm of the Blue Economy Project, the adoption of IRA's outlook on the Indo-Pacific, to name a few. 
However, ladies and gentlemen, there are several key challenges Aura that will affect Bangladesh Aura future dynamics. The first challenge is diversity. The Indian Ocean has incredible diversity in terms of region, language, ethnicity, and culture. And this diversity is undoubtedly a potential obstacle in creating a regional identity and realizing more factional cooperation in the future, ladies and gentlemen. The second challenge is that Aura lacks the political will to set up an effective regional institution. Uh, there has been only uh, one summit of the heads of the government which took place back in 2017. The third challenge is the lack of visibility. Knowledge about Aura and each other is still not high among Aura countries. Uh, the fourth challenge is the lack of resources. And uh, we can see that it has not only placed constraints on the ability of member states to participate in or uh, or our activities, but also limits the ability of the secretariat to serve the association adequately. However, I would like to highlight the uh, main challenge for Bangladesh will be to continue the you know to build on the momentum that the organization has achieved since its revival and to implement the target set out as a second action plan. So in order to ensure an effective role in the coming days, Bangladesh should seek to strengthen linkages between IRA agenda with Bangladesh's domestic and foreign policy goals of maritime security. For instance, Indonesia and South Africa sought to align our agenda with global maritime fulcrum and Africa's integrated maritime security 2050 respectively. In this regard, Bangladesh could think of aligning it with development to 2100 and blue economy development work plan. The second would be Bangladesh should engage to increase the visibility of IRA with a view to raising the profile of IRA globally. Bangladesh could propose to hold another summit level meeting and uh, the third would be Bangladesh could try to ensure that the voice of every member states it has, our foreign honorable foreign minister has pointed out that our aim will be to move together as a region and we will prioritize capacity building of SIDS, LDCs, developing states along with the member states and dialogue partners. And the motto is rightly claimed, ladies and gentlemen, Bangladesh is focusing on inclusiveness. The capacity building is prioritized and uh, through our development initiative and the proposed establishment of our development fund. However, there is a need for more people-centered and concrete development projects. Bangladesh needs to bring dialogue partners into the broader cooperation projects as well. And the guidelines on the strategic management of IRA's engagement is a positive step in, step in this regard. On a similar note, uh, strengthening IRA's relations and engagement with other institutional and regional organizations needs to be given priority. In this record, we have seen IRA is focusing, IRA's action plan is focusing on ASEAN, um, EU, uh, Indian uh, Ocean Commission. However, Bangladesh, uh, together with Vice Chair Sri Lanka, uh, uh, you know, should pursue IRA's a closer engagement with BIMSTEC to enhance its profile in the Bay of Bengal from my perspective. But most important, the Bangladesh needs to create a mechanism with a view to monitoring the implementation of IRA's second action plan, which is missing today. One option could be assigning the working groups of each priority area to periodically monitor and evaluate the implementation of the action plan, ladies and gentlemen. Bangladesh's chairmanship of IRA is a great moment for our country to look at the Indian Ocean. It is an important opportunity for Bangladesh to play a bigger role in the Indian Ocean region. While there is a room for optimism, as I have highlighted, there are some of the challenges as well. However, Bangladesh, together with other member states, could truly push the organization to play a more significant role in the coming days in the region and beyond. And the focus should be on the implementation of IRA's action plan that it has devised and continue the momentum. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Islam, for your presentation of the uh, research that you have done. And uh, I, I must say this, is, this gives a, a, a very broad idea about what IRA is and uh, how she can to leverage the chairmanship Bangladesh has now uh, for uh, 
for not only uh, forwarding our national interest, but also bringing together the uh, the member states uh, uh, to collaborate uh, closely. Uh, our second uh, presentation today is by uh, Nahyan Sajid Khan, uh, research officer, and he'll speak uh, to us on regional competition in the Bay of Bengal uh, implications for uh, Bangladesh. Uh, Mr. <coughs> Sajid Khan, uh, you have uh, the floor. Uh, thank you so much, uh, honorable uh, respected chair, uh, for giving me the floor. Uh, honorable chief guest, uh, respected director general and chairman of BIISS, uh, distinguished speakers, uh, learned guests, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and uh, very good afternoon to you all. It's my pleasure to talk in front of you at uh, BISC Colloquium 2022 on the topic of regional competition in the Bay of Bengal and implications uh, for Bangladesh. I have divided my presentation in six uh, different parts, starting with an introduction, uh, completing to the regional competition for uh, what and why Bay of Bengal is important, then identifying why Bangladesh is important and growing competition in the Bay of Bengal, and lastly, the challenges for Bangladesh. So, uh, Robert Kaplan uh, rightly identified that uh, the Indian Ocean unified the oceans and it connects the world from Africa to Far East. That is uh, perhaps the concept eventually developed into the Indo Pacific. Even before uh, Robert Kaplan, uh, the famous uh, naval strategist of USA, Alfred Hire Mahan, said, Whoever controls the Indian Ocean will dominate Asia and the destiny of the world will be decided on its water. His uh, preacher predicament seems to be. Uh, more realizing a day by day. If we see this, the idea in the Pacific strategy was first proposed by uh, in the speech of Japanese President Shinzo Abe in India, and he talked about broader Asia for and for prosperity rather than a militaristic idea. But eventually, we are seeing that in the Pacific is evolving into far more comprehensive, uh, interconnected, in very complex web of relationship and uh, variables in this process, which is complicating uh, the global politics in every way. And it's not just uh, United States or Japan, later on we see coming to Australia, we see UK, uh, EU, under the EU's banner, we, there is Netherlands, Germany and France, all have different uh, in the Pacific strategies for themselves. And we see the uh, targeting in the Indo-Pacific and the Bay of Bengal region, connecting the Indian Ocean. Uh, China is developing projects like BRI. India is taking up uh, initiatives like Sagar, security and growth for all the region, which indicates the, how important this area has been evolved into. And if we look into the Indo-Pacific, if we zoom into Indian Ocean, we see Bangladesh is at the very uh, convergent part of Southeast Asia. And South Asia and it's in the middle, it's in the apex of the Bay of Bengal in the very middle. So Bangladesh will soon will have to uh, think about how to tackle this growing pressure in the regional competition. So our regional competition for what? Uh, that is a question we all ask every time. In RAND Corporation uh, in 2022, in mid this year, developed a uh, Strat uh, a characteristics of area of competition, regional strategic competition, if I uh, identify, pointed out specifically, they, they decided these are the points when the countries uh, fight uh, uh, or compete with one another. Firstly, is a relative power in economic and military means, then resources, territorial claims. And, hey, let me. Uh, and uh, uh, change in the global order. And then we see when, when uh, they also identify the points when, when these competitions unfold in a more uh, multipolar world, uh, existing world order shift or the shift, uh, pressure on the status quo, technological revolution and uh, unnatural, man, not man-made crisis like climate change, pandemic or natural disaster induce imbalances in the global order, what eventually emerges into uh, crisis and then leads to competition. Competition is not arise by accidents, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pro production of 
for clashing interest and uh, uh, different objectives and for, by the major force, particularly when the major force try to achieve their own objective on the expense of the other. So that eventually leads to this competition. If we see relative power uh, on economic or military term, the countries try to continue their high growth. They try to uh, mold the favorable global, regional, economic and military uh, environment in their favor secure themselves on both terms and access to the resources which no, uh, uh, don't other countries don't have. If we go for resources, we see if specifically in the uh, near, in the Bay of Bengal, we see uh, there is a, a huge uh, depot of, uh, um, uh, what, uh, I'm sorry, the storage of natural resources like oil, gas. If we identify that how specifically in the Indo-Pacific country, just in South China Sea, though it's away from Bay of Bengal, it holds 7.7 .7 billion food oil reserve and 266 billion CFT gases. And also, uh, th this sort of issues, I am pointing out South China Sea because that is one of the most uh, territorial disputed zone, which is my next point, with six countries claiming overlapping uh, territorial jurisdiction over one another. Bangladesh has its own maritime territorial disputes with Myanmar and India, which are going to be solved through the multilateral process. So we are familiar with these sort of disputes occurring in the region. And for the changing global order, the uh, difference between a rising power and existing great power, uh, emerging middle powers, all these dynamics, the multipolarity, and convergent cross-cutting issues, bringing uh, narrowing gaps between great powers and emerging power. So thus this competition of uh, so-called status quo powers and revisionism is coming into play. And why Bay of Bengal? Bay of Bengal hosts a two point, uh, two be, over 2 billion people. 2 billion people is a 2 billion people's market. If we see uh, uh, pro, uh, production giants like USA, China, or EU investing and coming to these regions, they, they are coming for the market, they are coming for the investment. So this human resource, ladies and gentlemen, that resource makes uh, Bay of Bengal a very critical area, which has combined economy stands to three trillion. Uh, one third of the global trade goes through this region and massive uh, natural resource I already mentioned. Uh, Bay of Bengal region showed an unprecedented 7.3 uh, growth rate on average per annum driven by rapid industrialization and urbanization. And in this region, major powers are looking for establishing infrastructure because the Bay of Bengal uh, substantially lacks uh, infrastructure rather than if we consider ASEAN or EU. Even in Af uh, like, like Africa, South Asia uh, uh, seriously needs infrastructural development and investment in this regard, gaining market access, I already mentioned, achieving technological support, securing investment and finance and future trades is all the issues making Bay of Bengal important. And why Bangladesh? Uh, if I pinpoint down, uh, scale down into a single entity, Bangladesh. Bangladesh remains to be a bridge between South Asia and South East Asia. Half of the population is youth. It ha this has uh, two different uh, features. If we see this is a labor, this is a labor coming into the field, which can be reaped for a serious economic dividends, which will make prosperous region or a country. And if we see militarily, these are the peoples, if, uh, uh, God forbid, if any uh, clashes or conflict arises in the region, Bangladesh is a serious uh, country to be taken very seriously because half of the population is youth and military service ship. The economy grow uh, 188 times since uh, 2009, you hailed as an economic marvel around the world. And Bangladesh said to become by 2030 the ninth largest consumer, as I already mentioned about the market issues. 48% uh, rule of uh, this re uh, Bangladesh lives, will live in a city by 2030, which shows that our uh, rapid industrial and urbanization is going on. The Bangladesh said to become a middle, lower middle income country very soon. Uh, and, and the interesting fact about the three ports among two of the Bay of Bengal is in. Uh, Bangladesh, which makes the possibility of this region becoming a, a connectivity hub from Asia to Far East. The, as for uh, growing competition, we see there are a number of initiatives 
involving in the Indo-Pacific, considering Indian Ocean and Bay of Bengal region. First, we came to know about the string of pearl, where the where it is developed by a network for commercial and military bases around the countries, an idea developed by the Chinese strategies for a, as denominated as a Chinese grand strategy. Then we see the Belt and Road Initiative, the multi-million dollar infrastructural uh, connectivity through sea and land. And then we see uh, the global security initiative by Xi Jinping calling for a unilateral actions are uh, opposing unilateral actions, denouncing group or block politics. Also uh, challenging US uh, use of unilateral sanctions. So uh, they, they have the, this is called as the Chinese version of global security. And assertive diplomacy, Though it's a, de a debated concept, but we you know we all know of the wolf warrior strategy or the drip trap theme. Though it was later debunked by even the Chatham House, that they called it the, the myth of uh, drip trap, which was uh, not persistent. Then we come to the United States from 2017, 18, and subsequently uh, USA published a number of documents from uh, Indo-Pacific strategy from DOD to. Uh, the Department of State. Then we came to see the White uh, White House paper on policy paper on 2022 and the National Security and National Defense Strategy in 2022, denominated uh, the Indian Ocean region and the Indo-Pacific region as a conflicting area and the re-rise of the great power competition in the region. So we see the situation is heating up uh, in in this uh, region and Bangladesh being part of the region will be uh, touched by the heat of this competition. Uh, if I go for the Bangladesh's challenges, the first issue uh, I came is, is the lack of regionalism in South Asia and Bay of Bengal. If we see that EU ASEANs are holding persistently against uh, Chinese aggression to uh, this uh, regional initiative, but South Asia, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, uh, lacks the uh, strong regional initiatives to counter any singular oppressor or a collective oppression from any big power. The repatriation of forcefully uh, displaced Myanmar national is a specific concern for Bangladesh because uh, the repatriation of the Rohingyas, is, I believe, is far overdue. Because over the five years, Bangladesh has been uh, uh, doing its best to support this uh, uh, Rohingya population for their uh, betterment and Bangladesh is still following the burdens, but we, as we know that this issue is souring down and the possibility of repatriation is thinning down perhaps in day by day. The recovery of the post COVID-19 situation, we know that the economic damage done by the COVID-19 was a global and Bangladesh is still uh, struggling to uh, recover this damage, especially the supply chain issue. Then Russo-Ukrainian war, we all suffered for electricity. I guess that explains the how much damage it was for our nation. And last but not the least, mutually beneficiary relations with the major powers. It is easy to say, but very hard to maintain because every actor has their own agenda and different objectives, a different way of failing the objective. But it is uh, the challenge for Bangladesh to how uh, to talk with them, to negotiate with them, and earn a favorable situation, keeping everybody in co uh, confidence and work for the mutual benefit. This is a true challenge, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, for me, uh, there is, I noted down three specific uh, uh, suggestions or recommendations by Bangladesh might uh, take it as a policy in future, but it's, it, it has a far more research to be, should be done in this regard. Bangladesh needs to maintain its strategic hedging because I am calling this hedging because balancing uh, takes the uh, debate to a military stick aspect, but rather hedging gives a soft approach because I believe Bangladesh is not thinking of any uh, initiative as a serious military threat to its national security. Then uh, Bangladesh needs to increase the proactive role. We know Bangladesh is now perhaps one of the very active uh, participants in the multilateral system under the UN. So uh, Bangladesh uh, is doing absolutely fine, but we think we can go ahead a bit ahead for to mitigate this issue. And the point comes in that multi, under the multilateralism umbrella, we can go for minilateralism. 
though it's idea driven from the militaristic ideas from uh, ideas like quad or ideas like AUKUS we are thinking about but Bangladesh like uh, soft powers like you know Sri Lanka first Maldives work with Nepal and Bhutan work with Indonesia Thailand like a flexible uh, set of uh, like a flexible set of um, countries can work together to develop these issues because it's more voluntarily it is issue based rather than the geographic proximity uh, the institutional institutional bindings are loose it is uh, not very issue specific not a comprehensive policy the multi minilateralism can be the way forward for bangladesh so and that is all from my side thank you ladies and gentlemen for your patience hearing Thank you, Sajid, and uh, you have just stopped uh, right on the dot because uh, uh, 30 seconds later you would have been warned by me uh, to uh, to finish your uh, presentation. And uh, on that note, uh, may I now turn to our uh, research director, uh, Dr. Mahfuz Kabir, uh, to make his presentation, and he will be uh, covering uh, the issue of diversifying export basket and market role of Bangladesh foreign missions. Honorable Chief Guest, respected chair of the session, respected director general of BISS, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as already mentioned by our, our session chair. So I, I'll be speaking on the export of Bangladesh and how to expand market and diversify Bangladesh uh, export basket. So uh, as we uh, can understand readily, Bangladesh has witnessed a considerable change in the export uh, over the last Three decades, in fact, and and it has undergone a, a set of unilateral trade liberalization policies, basically starting uh, since 1990s. And uh, the uh, the corresponding result was that Bangladesh uh, has achieved a uh, significantly higher export GDP ratio, and it has been increasing steadily uh, till uh, the uh, mid of uh, 2010. And then the export of goods has significantly concentrated towards uh, the few products, like uh, if you consider the case of RNG. And and broadly the textile and clothing that's specifically dominating our export basket. More than 85% of the total export of goods is, uh, in fact, explained by the export of uh, but these uh, broad items. So that is a, a concern. And and if we see the the other regional countries like India, uh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Pakistan, so Bangladesh, uh, in fact, uh, if we see the dotted line, dotted line is Bangladesh export uh, GDP ratio, which is the export of goods and services which uh, in fact increased uh, till uh, 2010 and then 2011 and then uh, in fact downward sloping and it, it has two in fact connotations one is basically bangladesh in fact domestic economy has increased significantly so it has strength uh, uh, that we have uh, seen so that that's a positive sign but uh, from the other side uh, we can in fact there is a kind of uh, pessimism which is that bangladesh if bangladesh had a diversified product and services basket then Probably we could achieve higher, uh, in fact, export GDP ratio. As we, if we consider the case of, in fact, Vietnam, so they have, in fact, more than three hundred billion dollars export. So it's, it's about the uh, export GDP ratio is about the one hundred percent. So even though during the period of COVID nineteen and and uh, the ongoing, uh, in fact, global economic crisis, uh, the Vietnamese economy is doing very well in terms of its export. Uh, so. That is basically a, a concern because the size of the GDP of, of Vietnam is in fact smaller than the that of Bangladesh. So, but they are doing very well. So, just because of the diversification of, of the uh, products and services. So that that's a, a kind of example, the bright example uh, in, in the part of Asia. So, in the other uh, countries of the world which have diversified their export market, they are they are doing very well. So. And the Bangladesh, so there are some positive sides, like I mean, the MFA phase out. So, even though we have had a scare about the in fact potential result, but Bangladesh has done very well. And with that kind of hope, so we are in fact now expecting that after the graduation of, from LDC, so we can do very well. So, because we have a good in fact past track record, so and and even by in the global financial crisis, so as I already mentioned, so then Bangladesh. Domestic economy has performed very well and it, it has got strength. So it has successfully, in fact, uh, faced the challenges of global uh, financial crisis in 2007 and 2009. And it's the China uh, USA trade war, has, which has started back in 2018, even though uh, in this, uh, in fact, trade war, Bangladesh has done very well in terms of its, its export of goods and services. So, but 
now we, we are facing the economic slowdown around the world because of the Russia Ukraine war, which uh, has created a massive disruption of global uh, supply chain and rapid deceleration in the in the global trade. So the, and that is a concern because we don't know the uh, possible uh, end period of the of the war. So and that has created an uncertainty and all the countries of the world facing the serious external balance uh, crisis. So if you see the the kind of trend over the last uh, four decades uh, of, of our export, so if even if we see the uh, continuous growth of, of in terms of the size, the, the volume of uh, export, except the year 2019-20, but if you see the, the growth, so there is a huge fluctuation. So and there are a lot of theories uh, on, on in favor of the diversification. If the basket is diversified, the portfolio is diversified, then definitely so uh, the the fluctuation is less. But if the the basket is, is concentrated, then the fluctuation is high. So that is basically the critical and empirical prediction from the international economy. So now if you see the trend of export of services, so that has an encouraging kind of trend. So even though we have the data from 2015 and 16 from the Bangladesh Bank, so just try to docu document. And we can see a kind of trend which is positive, even though in, in the year 2009 and 20, so we have a slightly decline. Of, of, of export, but it's not something like I mean, the, the trend of, of uh, the goods export. So in goods export has has, has decreased significantly in, in 2019-20. So what is the reason? So I tried to identify, and then I found that so out of the to, total 20, 12 sectors, so half of the sectors have significant contribution. So the, the 50 percent of the uh, export uh, sector of services is diversified. So that is a big uh, kind of in fact blessing for us, and and because of that we have not in fact seen a significant decline uh, of the export of services in 2019-20. So that speaks a volume. So if we can diversify the product, uh, the basket of goods, then we can also get the benefit. And now uh, our export of services is uh, about 16 percent of of the total export. So in the year 2021-22. So the total export of goods and services was around 61 billion US dollars. So it's, it's, it has exceeded the target uh, of, of the export policy of Bangladesh and the, the target was 60 billion. So we have across the racket and we are expecting that according to the uh, export policy of 2021-24, so we can uh, achieve the target of 80 billion US dollars if we can diversify the export basket. So we have the overarching objectives like um, the, we achieved the vision uh, 2030 uh, and by 2031 we want to become an uh, upper middle income country and by 2041 uh, so we want to become an industrially developed high income country. So that this, and, and we have a clear guideline in the 85 plan to uh, in fact uh, meet the challenges and tapping the opportunity within the broad development strategy which also includes the export diversification. And what are the major aspects? I also already identified the basket of goods and services is heavily concentrated, especially the goods basket, basket which is concentrated towards the few, very few products, even though there are some potential items which I'll, I'll identify later on. And then a high concentration of RMG products and RMG and LI products, and there is a value chain leakage of RMG products with the textile and, and other parts of the clothing. And the export of goods is concentrated. To mainly Europe, North America, especially US and Canada, and then few other developed countries like developing countries like uh, in Asia, like India. Very recently, in, uh, our export performance to India is, has increased significantly. In the last fiscal year, it was about uh, two billion in, in terms of goods, and in terms of services, it was just uh, two billion plus US dollars. And few uh, service dominates, as I already mentioned, within the uh, export basket of services, there are few. Uh, that that has uh, performed very well. So if you see the the graph, so uh, now if, if we can see in EU, EU uh, plus UK, 54 billion uh, percent of the total export of goods, and then uh, North America 24, so it's slightly increasing uh, over, uh, uh, over over the years. And in SAC, only 4%, ASEAN only 1%, so in uh, South America only one. In fact, uh, uh, and in Africa less than one percent, it's a point nine two percent. So that is basically the configuration. So we have the vast part of the world in which we can uh, increase our export of goods. And and if we consider the case of the composition, the net wire, so forty four point five seven percent, it's gradually increasing. Uh, Oven garments thirty seven point two five percent, and then other uh, items of of textile, so 
3.34 percent put at so it has a good potential uh, so 2.31 percent so basically this altogether 47.47 percent but if you consider the case of the export alone of goods in uh, november this year so the contribution of uh, in fact rmd sector is more than 85 percent so it's heavily concentrating towards a few uh, kind of goods and if we consider the services so you, you can find a, a large number of in fact uh, sectors and subsectors and the, what are the major destinations 24% uh, USA China 15% Singapore 14 India 9% Russia 7% UK 5% Germany 5 and others 21% uh, so it's fairly diversified in fact location if you consider the case of export of basket of, of services but we still have the room to expand our in fact footprint in, in the world so this is a, a graph it's a comparison of other countries in the in the region uh, in terms of uh, in fact export diversification bangladesh is, has the least diversification if you consider the trend of of in fact uh, the export diversification index so it has a good potential if we see the yellow uh, in fact bubbles then then you can find that we have the even though we perceive that china would be our uh, Good destination, but unfortunately, could not in fact uh, tap the potential. Till now, even though they are providing the 80, the 98 percent of the of the GDP free access to our products, but still, uh, we could not in fact materialize our, our potential. So, it's it's about half a billion dollar. But if we consider the with India, so India, in India, we are exporting about two billion of, of goods. So there are other countries like I mean, UAE is a potential, and also United Kingdom because. This figure it shows that we the products that we export to the to the countries, these products are also imported by all these countries from from the world market. So we have the potential in in this uh, yellow uh, bubble countries. So now I have uh, in fact tried to identify the the in fact our footprint to the world in terms of export of goods in in the map. So uh, and we have the commercial wing. So I, and I, I'll focus on on this particular issue. So the, the in fact objective of the commercial wing is to expand our uh, goods and services to, to these corresponding markets to uh, a club of in fact countries and, and regions in some uh, particular areas in the, through the mission. So if we see the in fact composition, then it, the in fact commercial wings are concentrated mostly uh, towards uh, in fact South Asia, Southeast Asia, and then the part of Europe and then uh, USA, Canada, and then Australia. So that is basically the, the locations and we don't have any any uh, kind of in fact, footprint through the commercial links in, in Africa. So that is uh, um, and, and lacking and, and also in, in the Latin America. So this is basically a side, but in fact, if we uh, uh, consider the case of in fact, our exports. So in some of the parts in which we are in fact doing very well in terms of exporting goods, in which we don't have any, any commercial doing in, in the missions. So the similar case in the in the case of in fact export of services. So uh, uh, in the traditional missions in which we have the uh, in fact commercial wings, so we are doing well. But there are other in fact uh, regions in which we need commercial wing, but we don't have uh, currently. But they are doing very well in terms of export of services. So I try to identify that the in fact the kind of performance of the uh, commercial wings, and we have seen that. In some of the wings, they are not performing very well. So, for example, if we consider the case of uh, Myanmar, the Yangon, and Tehran, so they are not doing very well. But maybe strategically, these uh, locations are important in terms of ex expanding our uh, commercial services. But uh, there are others, like I'm um, the Switzerland, in fact, even Singapore. So there, in, we have the, the footprint uh, to expand our uh, commercial, in fact, uh, interest. So. But still, I mean, then we have a lot of expectations because other countries are doing very well through their through these missions. But I mean, we cannot, in fact, perform that, even though in, during the 2021 and 22. So there are others, in fact, which are doing very well. So, for example, the Poland. So they are, in fact, through these missions. So our export is more than uh, two billion US dollars. But even though we don't have any any commercial doing, uh, through the case of Netherlands, Italy, Denmark, Sweden, uh, they are doing very well. And also Turkey, so we can in fact perhaps think of in fact establishing commercial links to expand more in terms of uh, our exports of goods and services. So in terms of services, so if we consider the performance of the commercial links, so uh, in fact it's it's more or less good uh, that if we consider the case of performance. But there are few in fact areas in 
which we can improve upon. For example, the Luxembourg, the Czech Republic, Malaysia. So we have a lot of potential in Malaysia, especially in the, in the Southeast and East Asian countries, but we could not, in fact, probably we, we have to uh, consider, reconsider the, our strategy in these uh, areas. So in the commercial, uh, in, in the emissions, we don't, don't have the commercial wings. For example, if you consider the case of Hong Kong, so it's, it's very, doing very well in terms of export of services, around 1 billion US dollars. So they are uh, ex exporting of uh, the, the goods uh, and, and services, more than in fact 1 billion dollars of combined export of goods and services. And the same course of Netherlands, Saudi Arabia, Thailand. So we have very good potential, but uh, we don't have the commercial wing. So if we have, if we can establish, then, then probably we can do well. So what are the products that, that can be included in our export buckets with two uh, priorities, like electrical and electronics? So we have now, in fact, identified more than 100 export uh, in fact, special economic zones. And also we have the export processing zones. And we are trying to, in fact, attract the foreign investment in these uh, regions. And a lot of local investments are also going to the SEJ. So there might be the, their investment in, in the electrical and electronics and light engineering products. These are very potential items. And then plastic, even the plastic is uh, regarded as, as the polluting industry, but still, it is a, a lot of uh, potential. If we uh, consider the recycling, reuse, reduce, so the kind of in fact, circular economy, then we can do very well. The pharmaceutical then uh, is a good uh, product that, that we can export. Then software and IT enabled services is doing very well. It's about half a billion and, and the size is increasing. So we can also highlight on this. Then travel and tourism, that can be one of the, in fact, if the services that can do very well. Then handicapped and GI products. So now we are doing well. We have identified some of the products that can uh, have good in fact, export performance. And uh, raw and processed crab and eel. So that has also been identified in, in our export policy, 2021 and 2024. The tea, especially the organic and value added tea. So that, that can be another uh, item. And the frozen food and fish is traditionally doing well, but we can also expand this, this product. And the raw and processed vegetables, which has done very well in the recent year in terms of its export performance. And then good diversity of progress. Now the world wants to have in fact, more uh, in fact, environmentally friendly goods uh, to uh, their in fact, import basket. Then we can in fact, uh, try to in fact, export uh, good diversity of products to the world market. So what are the requirements? It's basically the last part of my presentation. So a comprehensive repository of, of information uh, should be established in the Ministry of Commerce. Because there is a close collaboration with the Ministry of Commerce, Commerce and Ministry of Foreign Affairs in terms of in fact, expanding our business interest in the world. So uh, it can in fact, guide our in fact, foreign mission to expand our uh, product and services basket to the world. And economic dependence, and the Honorable Prime Minister has clearly guided the foreign mission to in fact, strengthen our economic dependency. And the Honorable uh, Foreign Minister, he has also in fact, instructed the, the missions uh, to increase our exports uh, in the corresponding destinations so and and it has to be strengthened and bangladesh should create its own brands so that is very much required it's already uh, talked in, in various forums but we still we, we are lagging behind so we, if we can in fact establish our new brand, uh, our own brands then definitely it can in fact, do uh, and it can in fact, help expand our export basket and we can also enhance solar division is doing in fact is going on but we have to in fact have visibility in the, in the international trade fair to diversify the export products. And then some regions still have, uh, in fact, uh, untapped potential. For example, if we consider the case of Africa and then Latin America and, and also the parts of the uh, Southeast and East Asia, so we, still, we are still lagging behind. So we can have our uh, new in fact, strategy through our foreign missions. And training and orientation. So we, that is a, a core thing because if we consider the, the in fact, activities of the other missions, what we working in, in Bangladesh. So they are they have their in fact main strategy to is to expand their business interest in, in Bangladesh in different sectors. So similarly we can we can do the same thing even though the in fact missions are doing uh, already doing things but we have to have the training and initiatives to so that we, they can in fact proactively ex, uh, in fact work to expand our business interest in, in the corresponding region. And then in fact uh, global value chain, so it has already mentioned in, in the uh, 85 plan document uh, and, and also the export policy so that we can integrate ourselves with the regional and global value chain. Now we have only one, in fact, sector, textile and clothing. So 
through this sector, we have the linkage with the regional and global value chain, but we also have to identify the other sectors like the uh, light engineering sectors and, and many others uh, so, so that we can be integrated. And through the value chains, we can integrate ourselves with in inter industry trade. So that is very much required. And there is another thing. So we, now we have the seven out of the 10 best, in fact, the greenest in fact, factories in, in the world. So we can, in fact, determine some of the such, in fact, uh, good things uh, to the world so that they can be attracted and they can come here to invest and also uh, take our products to, to their corresponding markets. So, and in fact, uh, the, if we can, in fact, establish, already I have mentioned, so the territories like the Warsaw, the Hague, in fact, the Rome, Copenhagen, Stockholm, Ankara, and Vienna. So these are the potential, uh, in fact, uh, missions in which we can establish the commercial wing because they are doing very well, even, even though they don't have the commercial wing. And the Hong Kong is also a very good uh, place in which we can have the commercial wing. And Riyadh also can be an, another place, and also Bangkok, Lisbon. So they are doing very well in terms of uh, promoting the export of goods and services in which we can, in fact, establish the commercial wing. And uh, Yongon, Tehran, so they are not the only, in fact, uh, underperformer, but they are, we can identify some more. So then, even though in export policy, so it has been mentioned that the performance of the each of the missions can be evaluated, especially the commercial wings. But I think, I mean, it's not, uh, being done regularly, so we can do the things and, and in fact, we consider the strategies of, of the underperformers. With this, we can, in fact, achieve good things. So, uh, I, I would like to thank everyone uh, for passion sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kabir, for uh, your uh, presentation identifying the potential that the foreign uh, missions have and the role that they can play. Um, we are uh, running out of time and we are lagging behind. Uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, we'll uh, have enough time for a, a open discussion. Uh, but keeping in mind that we will uh, like to uh, finish our uh, inaugural session uh, in another uh, 20 minutes time, uh, can we have a... <clears throat> 15, 20 minutes max uh, open se session. And uh, with that in mind, may I also request you to, uh, to make your comment limited within a minute's time so that we have a larger number of, uh, of uh, questions and comments coming from the floor and also giving time to uh, our uh, panelists to respond to your uh, queries. With that, I have I've, I've seen uh, um, Professor Anderson. Sorry, uh, you may uh, begin the uh, session for uh, the open discussion. So you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I came to this seminar with a very high hope. I think I can still maintain my high hope because this is the first ever research columbia on Indian Ocean, Ring, Association, etc., etc. But I thank and compliment the three paper presenters all heartedly. But I was thinking of hearing Alfred Tear Maha. He published a book in 1796, influence of the sea power in history. Uh, secondly, Lord Curzon, when he was in the exalted position of Viceroy of India in 1905, commented that in the 21st century, the Indian Ocean is going to be the ocean of the century. And that's taking shape, actually. And in fact, in 1993, I published the first ever book by a Bangladeshi on the Indian Ocean, titled South Asian, no, Superpowers and Security in the South Asian Perspective, etc., in the Indian Ocean, which subsequently 
uh, had the UGC about the synthesis. But in that book, I have literally and in a detailed way explained the role of the European powers in the Indian Ocean. And still, the motive of external power intervention in the Indian Ocean region is still there. Secondly, in the 11th century, the Cholas of South India obstructed the Chinese Navy, but for this challenge, Indian Ocean would have been the Chinese Ocean. India is trying to step into that role. So that is a very big question, big and deep question. Finally, I have seen geographically that there are as many as 54 littoral countries in the Indian Ocean region. Why is there only 23 members in the IOR? And my final comment is that Indian Ocean uh, IORA is not much known to the media. That's simply because of the political will. So I think SARC has almost in the dead, been in the dead bed because of the lack of political will. I think we need IORA. We have to gear up our efforts and activities to keep this institution alive. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Every time you speak, you uh, teach us, you uh, make us understand uh, the uh, how much ignorant we are. Thank you very much, sir, for your comment. Uh, may I now, uh, 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 yes, sir, you have, and, and after that, uh, Mr. Salahuddin, and then we'll come to the, uh, the gentleman, uh, on the fourth row, I suppose. So you have the floor for me. Hey, Mr. Siddiqui, I want to uh, give some comments on the paper of uh, Mr. Dr. Marcus Covid, because I don't understand the politics and diplomacy, only the trade and economics. So it was a good presentation. Uh, I want to uh, point out some of the uh, points he, he could raise here. One of the problem we are going to face is the LDC graduation. And also he, he wants to highlight the recommendation for a, a, ex, ex, increase the export, but he didn't refer to the FTA, the, some of the barriers, we don't have FTA. Our, uh, our, all the competitors in the global market have free trade agreement and we don't have. We have some more structural problem. We, we, we are lacking, the, lacking behind the trade facilitation and also reform in taxation system. We are not uh, giving up due attention to that. And also another for export diversification, uh, one of the major challenge now today is the bond license because it was an opportunity with the bond license. Now, now a day we can't diversify our product because we are unable to give bond license to only to garments industries. Uh, they are trying to expand it to leather industry, but for other sector, they don't have capacity. So it is better to withdraw the band facility and reduce the cost of the basic raw materials, tax of the basic raw materials, so that everybody can go to export market. So, and I, I can refer to the IMF condition of this uh, for the loan. I, 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 I think so, but you have posed enough question for uh, the presenter to respond to. But one thing I, I must uh, uh, say that uh, uh, the restrictions on, on uh, bond licensing has just come about now. Before that, we have had 50 years and uh, the product diversification issue has still remained a big question for, for our economy. Uh, may I now uh, turn to, thank you, sir. Um, uh, may I now turn to uh, Mr. Salahuddin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. This is Salahuddin Ahmed. I was member of Bangladesh Energy Regulatory Commission, and I was also a faculty. I was banker. I was English TV news host on BTV, and I am now a trainer on language skills. Uh, I must uh, thank uh, Dr. Kabir, research director, to mention 
uh, a comprehensive repository of information, which looks like a panacea and easy, easy to attain, uh, which we can think very seriously about. Another issue came, uh, he pointed out about commercial wings in some of the countries like one um, Myanmar and others, I don't remember, but uh, he mentioned about the underperformance of those commercial wings, but at the same time, he mentioned of some strategic importance that, is, that are the reasons for being there, put there. So uh, to lessen our frownings or worries and to uh, and lessen their embarrassment, we can we just change the name of commercial wings to anything else, in particular those, particularly those countries where, where they are not performing well. And one slide I, sh I would not suggest to show it now. I may check it later with Dr. Kabir, where he mentioned ab about slight decline in 2019-20 uh, of export, probably the service area, uh, which uh, I thought it's sharp decline, not slight. Well, we'll- So if you have a question, G please- no, uh, only, only thing that the, the a uh, comprehensive report, uh, repository of information that is to be given very serious attention. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Salahuddin. Uh, gentlemen, uh, with on, uh, I'll come to you uh, uh, in the back after the gentleman has, has made his comment. Sir, you have the floor. Sir. Thank, you. Thank you very much, sir. I'm Dr. Zahid Khan, a retired group captain from Bangladesh Air Force. Uh, I just have uh, three quick comments and Probably my one is uh, related as a as a reader of uh, politics and international relations is related much to the methodology and the uh, rigor that we apply in research than uh, other things. So the first uh, about the first presentation on Motus Islam, uh, yeah, I think there are it's it's a very broad area that she has touched and uh, uh, and one of the points that was actually highlighted. Uh, she says that there is an increase of 27 billion uh, in trade among the IOR uh, states. Such generic uh, expressions could be sort of supplemented with how many of those countries we had FTAs or whether we had open commercial wings, so that it becomes relevant to the uh, objective of this research, uh, which uh, which could sort of embolden the, uh, the the logic here and, and the causal connections. Whether we are seeing that the IOR has been an important uh, avenue for trade expansionism or not. Uh, uh, these are uh, the other one, which I, th I think there is another thing which could be a very valid point of raising or in the recommendation is that uh, the IORA, uh, what there's, there seems to be no mechanism on what happens if we have an oil spill in, in the Bay of Bengal area or the Indian Ocean region. IORA seems to be a, a particular platform where uh, these particular agendas can be uh, raised in, in terms of compensations, attributions, detections, and all those kind of stuffs. Because multilateralism will be essential to find out a mechanism of addressing that kind of catastrophe happening in our uh, uh, ocean space. But fundamentally, the most important, uh, the most uh, sort of uh, my fun, uh, very basic observation of the, is uh, on the second presentation uh, by Sajid Khan. Uh, I think in any research, academic research, you also need to ground the argument on existing theories. Uh, Professor Anorsa has mentioned about Mahan, but in this context, uh, and as I can see that the regional competition of Bang Bay of Bengal and implications for Bangladesh, there is very important, uh, it's, it's so sort of almost mandatory that we talk about, uh, we at least embed one or two theories here. One would be uh, Glenn Schneider's, stability and instability paradox, or Barry Buzan's uh, regional security complex. I haven't seen that once. So that could be one of the areas which sort of explains what he later on sort of alluded to, that the great power and emerging power dynamics. So embedding that uh, his uh, arguments onto one of the theory would sort of strengthen his, his things. And perhaps more importantly, we need to go beyond a simplistic narrative like explaining why Bangladesh by telling what is our statistics. Because we need to say, uh, take the argument, 
So if you can kindly uh, limit your uh, comment within the time frame that I had indicated. Okay. Uh, so very... I think that that is, that is what I would leave with one uh, final point on this is that why Bangladesh, why compared to Myanmar? Because that is where we have certain edges and that needs to be addressed whether why powerful nations would be, are more inclined to be aligned with Myanmar with all those records as opposed to all the shining records that we have here in the diplomatic form. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for your comments. I think um, our uh, presenters and, and researchers have taken uh, careful note of your observation and suggestion and will enrich their uh, work in the future work. Uh, the lady at the back, madam, you have the floor. Yes, you have raised the floor. And I, I, I don't know whether uh, we are, uh, uh, we have received any uh, requests. I'm, I'm, I'm referring to my colleagues here uh, who are uh, following uh, the online participants. If we have any uh, uh, one raising uh, uh, the flags to, to make a question, we'll give that uh, floor to them. Uh, Madam, uh, at the back, you have the Thank you for Please. giving me the floor. I'm Shomi Shoptapurnanath from CBGA. So my question is, Ms. Moshomi, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, you were talking about the inclusive Bangladesh policy regarding the blue economy and cooperations. But uh, as we all know that uh, the dialogue partners of IORA like uh, India, China, and the United States and Russia have been confronting each other in the Indian Ocean region as well as in the Bay of Bengal. And they have their own ideas like India has Sagar and China has BRI and uh, United States has IPS. So uh, Japan has FOIP. So, how do you think that Bangladesh can create inclusivity uh, among these strategic rivals in terms of uh, cooperation in the Bay of Bengal as well as in the, and, I mean, in the blue economy as well as in the Bay of Bengal and Indian Ocean region? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, sir, please uh, keep in mind that your time is one minute. Huh? <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Cornel Richard Ittaka. Sir, I had the opportunity of attending one of the conference of IRA in Perth, Australia in 2016. From that perspective, I have seen that IRA is quite efficient uh, body, and since then it has come uh, quite far. But uh, very rightly pointed out, IRA needs a secretariat definitely somewhere because now it is a floating organization kind of thing. But I have seen how influential Bangladesh rep representatives from the foreign ministry were during that time, I'm, I'm sure that is one of the contributing reasons why Bangladesh is now uh, chair of IRA. So my suggestion is Bangladesh can promote this idea of making it, uh, making a secretariat somewhere among the IRA states. Number one and number two suggestion is IRA doesn't have an executive body to implement the decisions. So it must have a executive authority combining with the armed forces of IRA member states. So if we can do that, definitely IRA will have another step ahead. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for having served abroad. One thing has uh, become very clear that people have got a great uh, degree of uh, apprehension about creating new structures, especially when it comes to secretariat, meaning new bureaucracy, a layer of bureaucracy, and ad additional uh, funding expenses. So. Uh, perhaps down the line, that could be one of the uh, areas that that could be looked into. And and the final question, sir, uh, uh, the, uh, from Madam, uh, please uh, uh, make your comment short. And the gentleman uh, there would be the final one before we request our panelists to respond. We are uh, uh, truly running short of our time. Madam Apni, Apni Ji. Thank you so much for giving me the chair. I'm Professor Tawita Bharati. I was the, I'm the uh, director, uh, director general of the Minister of Women and uh, Children Affairs. And the, my question is the, uh, the Bayam the Bayam Bengal has got a very important role in the economy of Bang in Bangladesh. And we have seen that uh, this uh, the problems, uh, the Indian Indian Myanmar uh, visa has got the main uh, in, unemployment is in India, India and Myanmar. And the problem is all that the uh, Rohingya and the militarism under the umbrella of military terrorism and lack of regional initiative. So, our initiative, how far it, it uh, 
uh, it solves our problem and we have to ask uh, suggestions in the mother and to minimize the problems to solve and minimize them. Thank you so much. Thank you, madam. Last question. Uh, Thank you, sir. From, from, please. Uh, Brigadier General is asked, uh, the former defense advisor. So my question is, our greatest achievement was the demarcation of the maritime boundary. It is related to Bay of Bengal. And uh, my question is that, sir, do we have any statistics or research that after the demarcation, what are the significance achievement or the benefits we have extracted from that region? Because it is very much related with security and economy and Rohingya issues as well. So are we really, uh, implementation has been done and some extraction of benefits has been done with the new demarcation. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I think that's a very pertinent issue and I'm, I'm, I'm sure our researchers will take uh, due note uh, to whether to do, uh, uh, whether not to uh, uh, delve into that uh, particular area because that would be of uh, certainly of great interest to our policymaker as well. But now I would uh, open Give the floor to uh, our presenters to respond. Uh, Thank you very much. So a lot of comments came from the floor. So I would like to respond to uh, start with uh, Mr. M. S. C. D. P. So he has talked about the LTC graduation. So there are two sides of the of the debate. So whether we are going to face an enormous challenge so that we cannot overcome. But I think our industrialists, the exporters, and and also the policymakers, they are. Uh, pretty confident about the, in fact, uh, facing the challenges. So we have already formulated the strategy of, of LDC graduation. There's some of the four ministries, they have uh, presented their, uh, in fact, uh, strategies. So uh, we're doing well in, in class of them, but still we have challenges and we are hopeful regarding the getting the PSP uh, plus facility, but they, these also have the challenges. FTS clearly mentioned in the in the export policy and also the 858 so we are uh, moving towards that, but there are also challenges regarding the AP or SEPA, trade facilitation and others like form licensing. So these are challenges, but still, I mean, the, we have other, in fact, behind the border constraints and we are working on that. And, and also the repository, very, in fact, I, I thought about that and there is an indication in the export policy, but it's not, uh, in fact, fully blown. So that is the thing. And, and definitely, I mean, if we consider the case of the performance of the, in fact, our, uh, missions, foreign missions, then I think there are a lot of rooms because we have not, in fact, identified this uh, yet as, as an area in which we can work on and we, we, we can promote the, the, in fact, commercial wings and, and access their performance. So I think we are working in some other sites, but the foreign missions are not, in fact, given em emphasis uh, previously. So that, that was the focus of my research. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mahfuz. Uh, I, I would like to add uh, one thing uh, to your, with regard to your presentation. Uh, what I, I thought would uh, have uh, enriched our understanding of the role of the private sector, because they are the, they are the principal player in terms of, uh, uh, first of all, in terms of creation of the product that we would sell, and in terms of the services that they would render first. And in terms of uh, the delivery at the uh, at 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 uh, international level through our missions through our uh, commercial wing, uh, that they can only do as much as what they are offered to. If you do not have the product, what would they go around and sell with? One of the uh, uh, this slide that uh, I I looked at, and the slide says that we have the potential of diversifying our product and market, and I didn't see much greater uh, coverage in terms of diversifying. First, you will have, will have to diversify the product that has been acquired a, 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 a for, for a very, very long time, at least in my 30 years uh, service with the, uh, with the government, and, and then also the destination. So uh, the missions are given the responsibility of carrying, uh, carrying out certain responsibilities and with the tools. You may, we may lay down thousands of responsibility, but without the tool, perhaps uh, is a, a little bit uh, of much to ask. And, and uh, perhaps there are reasons to be critical of our uh, uh, commercial wings or missions abroad, but then we have to have a, an objective look of how much we can do. Uh, I'll now turn to two of uh, young researchers. Uh, Motushi will take the floor now. 
Uh, thank you, sir, again for giving me the floor. I will address the question that was uh, basically for me, my presentation. Uh, first, uh, regarding the membership of IRA, um, the, uh, the IRA countries has to actually apply for the membership and the decision is based on uh, consensus. And uh, for example, uh, Pakistan, Myanmar has been uh, constantly trying to get the membership of IRA, but as there was a lack of consensus, they are not given the membership to IRA. Regarding the visibility of IRA, I wholeheartedly agree, sir, uh, that uh, IRA have to, you know, um, increase its visibility. And uh, during uh, Bangladesh's chairmanship, we have already seen certain developments. For example, observing IRA Day, uh, IRA's Youth Reader's Digest, and uh, the uh, you know, the familiarization visit of the Secretary General to different IRA countries. And uh, I would highlight that the media needs to focus on the positives of IRA. Uh, regarding the oil spill, as I have mentioned during my presentation, that uh, IRA is about to adopt a strategic framework on, of action on marine pollution in the Indian Ocean. I hope the oil spill will be addressed on that particular issue. Regarding the inclusivity, Inclusivity, uh, India is uh, not the uh, dialogue partner. It is one of the members of IRA. And yes, I agree, there will be challenges. But what we have seen that uh, Bangladesh has taken certain steps, uh, for example, IRA's outlook on, outlook on the Indo Pacific, then um, the inclusion of dialogue partners in IRA. Uh, meetings and uh, you know um, greater uh, uh, inclusion and uh, there are, are certain developments uh, in this regard uh, and last uh, that IRA needs to have secretary IRA has already a secretary in Mauritius and uh, uh, it has its secretary general Salman Al Farshi from uh, Indonesia and uh, during Bangladesh's chairmanship Bangladesh is trying to you know uh, make it more uh, relevant uh, during this period. Uh, that was all for me thank you sir. Thank you. Thank you, Motusi. Uh, Sajid. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, giving me the floor. I, I direct, uh, the two questions were directed to me was one by Dr. Zahid Khan, sir. Uh, a very well uh, uh, pointed of uh, the theory to substantiate my claims. I will take this to my uh, research because I, was, uh, I also believe the theories gives a uh, concrete foundation to the challenges, but as far as uh, we are talking about theories, I uh, use the RAND model of regional competition and identified as the characteristics of the competition and then analyze the process. So using not a theory, just a, rather a proper uh, a model, uh, how to uh, define a regional strategy competition. And as for regional security dynamics, stability or instability issue, I will cer certainly look into that uh, possibility because uh, if the findings are, are fit and and the facts matches with the theories i'll i'd be happy to incorporate uh, this as a uh, in the paper as it will some soon come out it's, it is yet to be published and um, then uh, come to the to the comparison of uh, myanmar as you said why bangladesh in compared to myanmar uh, sir uh, i was not having that thought in my mind that bangladesh is competing with anybody right now because it is making its own uh, position in the international arena rather than not competing uh, playing a zero-sum game with any countries even its neighborhood and the abroad so as far as uh, but if we think of, of uh, comparing this with the myanmar in both economic and military terms and this is a very uh, serious research for a, a broader uh, research scope is there that's a separate uh, thing to be uh, discussed in a separate research. And, and for my uh, substantiation, my I was looking forward to uh, uh, keeping Bangladesh's uh, this policy of strategy hedging and finding out that this is the appropriate policy we are following and as we should be following. But if I may mention, and everybody already knows, the famous dichotomy of uh, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the friendship to all malice was none, has been recently incorporated with the UN resolution for the guarantee of peace resolution was taken very recently. So I was arguing more of these issues that uh, the Bangladesh's uh, neutral stance uh, is its strength rather than not its weakness. And uh, lastly, about the question of Bay of Bengal, what we derived from the demarcation after the demarcation. Uh, sir, uh, the demarcation was well over, uh, We uh, it was uh, quite long before, but the uh, initiative of the government was substantial. 
as we see the first of all we need a policy to derive this benefit the first policy comes from the act the act was just uh, amended last year the maritime uh, territorial zone act which demarcates how we can use this territory then we can see the prospective plan uh, 2041 where we see very comprehensive study where the government appointed or how it will reap uh, blue economy benefits how it can use the bay of bengal uh, maritime resources then we see delta plan in uh, 2100 which uh, gives a comprehensive and in detail plan for 100 years how we can preserve these uh, resources how we can uh, efficiently sustainably manage and use its reap its benefit for generations so i think yes sir our government is at, uh, on its well uh, very well course derive the benefit from the demarcation sir thank you Thank you very much, uh, Sajid, uh, for responding and uh, to uh, and, and also to Mosfisi because uh, uh, your your uh, interventions gave clarity to the the questions uh, raised at, uh, and also to the uh, broader issues of uh, the research that you have undertaken. We have now come uh, to um, to the towards the end, and uh, it is now my privilege and honor to respect uh, the. Honorable Chief Guest, Honorable Foreign Minister of Bangladesh, to kindly uh, deliver his uh, remarks. Sir, you have the floor. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Ambassador Kazim Yadusin, the Chairman of BIISS. Dr. General, Major General uh, Sheikh Pasha Halaluddin. I see here uh, respected General, General Mubin, and Foreign Secretary Shabir Ahmed, my old friend, uh, Sayyid Anwar Hussain, and other distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you all. It is indeed uh, a great pleasure for me to be here at the Bangladesh Institute of International Strategic Studies, particularly research colloquium, which is quite an interesting. Uh, I personally thank the EIISS for inviting me and share my views on my behalf and on behalf of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as well as the government of Bangladesh. This is the month of great victory uh, in 1971. At the outset, I would like to pay my profound respect to the father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, whose unprecedented charismatic leadership and long struggle help us in achieving our long cherished independence. We pay homage to the memories of those three million martyrs whose supreme sacrifice made us a free nation. We also recall with deep gratitude the invaluable contribution made by our valiant freedom fighters and the two lucky women who sacrificed their honor for the liberation of our country. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Bangladesh follows a foreign policy which is based on the guiding principle of our great leader, the father of the nation, Bangladesh Sheikh Mujur Rahman. The principle is friendship to all, knowledge to its none. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs, with the dynamic leadership and guidance of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, is successfully conducting all of its diplomatic activities to make our country, a Shonar Bangla, a prosperous and peaceful country, the dream of father of the nation. The ministry has played a significant role in all of the development activities and roadmaps that have been adopted by the government in the last 14 years in line with the Vision 2021 and Vision 2041 set by the Honorable Prime Minister. Here at the ministry, in order to achieve those goals, the goals of 2021 and 2030 and 2041, we have developed certain packages. We have introduced uh, three packages. One package is known as economic diplomacy, and it had five components. Five components are, we like to help increase our total investment, inward investment, to like to increase our exports and also diversify the products. Three, gainful employment of our people, both home and abroad. And four, uh, 
technology transfer. Fifth, providing quality services to our diaspora as well as others. And there is a complement to it that reinforces this package, and that is known as public diplomacy. Public diplomacy designed so that you know we can help achieve our those goals, particularly uh, increase our FDI, you know, inward FDI. Uh, if a government employee tells another country the Bangladesh is a land of opportunity, is a vibrant economy, is a return on investment is relatively higher vis-a-vis -vis all our neighbors like India, you know, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. Uh, many may not believe it. However, if some uh, public figure abroad who is there because of his personal credibility, that individual says that Bangladesh is a land of opportunity, uh, many people will believe it. And therefore, our effort is also, we have designed another package that is known as public diplomacy. In addition, we have been promoting another package, and that is over the last 14 years, we have made significant achievement um, in our you know, GDP growth rate, in our all socioeconomic indicators. Uh, to sustain those indicators, we would like to have more peace and stability in this region. Because we have noticed wherever there is peace and stability is distorted or disturbed in those countries, they cannot sustain their development growth. In order to you know, sustain our development trajectory, we have promoted, we are promoting in the foreign means ministry another you know, package and that is known as our regional peace and stability package. We have, we have also been, uh, we, as you know, we have been able to graduate to a developing country with the unprecedented development activities that are taking place during this uh, uh, re recent era. This was possible because of the successful diplomacy of Bangladesh and the United Nations. In order to uplift the image of Bangladesh as a peaceful, progressive, and re responsible state, the government has strengthened its bilateral relations with its neighbors and other states by successfully maneuvering its foreign policy and diplomacy. In order to face the newly emerged uh, global challenges, the present government has played, in, uh, played and initiated a well-planned goal by its visible presence in the international mainstream to strengthen the regional and sub-regional cooperation. The present government has created an exemplary role in implementing a successful and realistic application of humanitarian diplomacy as well, particularly for Rohingya repatriation. The, and the, and the outstanding contribution of humanity by Honorable Prime Minister in order to accommodate, uh, provide shelter uh, to the persecuted people of Myanmar, known as Rohingya in Bangladesh, is indeed a rare in the world history. All of these successful endeavors has led Bangladesh as a rapidly developing state in the international arena. Even in the climate change, it has played a leadership role to save this planet Earth. Ladies and gentlemen, we are passing through a period of rapid transformation in this first changing world of many challenges. Each country has its own way of coming to terms with the challenge. Bangladesh, under the leadership of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, wants uh, to approach this change through people's empowerment and developing the agents of change. This empowerment comes from skills and knowledge, which in turn is developed through meaningful research in each issue that poses challenges to our progress. DIISS, as a prime strategic research body of the government, it plays an important role in this regard, hoping to advance knowledge and understanding of contemporary international and strategic issues in national and regional perspective. This is what the BIISS is con contributing to and its research sets are striving for. It is therefore the research sets and especially the young ones who are the agents of change to pursue knowledge for a glorious future. Uh, I have one observation today when I was listening to all the three presentations that at times empirical data talks about the past. But when we look forward, we're forward for future, yeah, we 
decide sympathetical data and their analysis. We may have to look into the qualitative aspects of the, uh, the scenario around the environment and other stakeholders. Uh, DIIS's uh, work is grounded in application of various political, economic, and social issues that cause instability, as well as the factors that can lead to international cooperation. This research institute has unique conveying power. It brings together various ministries of the government, including defense and foreign ministry, in various foreign formats, both privately uh, and private, publicly, to discuss, explore, and shape important security policy. It holds important events each year involving important political figures, scholars, academics, journalists, civil servants, think tanks, plus many distinguished personalities from both home and abroad. The very idea of such an institute is to work together to get stakeholders creative solutions that will benefit all people. The institute's driving vision is of, of a world where peace prevails to our country through training, promotion of national culture, monitoring national security development, and finally establishing a constructive relationship between relevant academic and executive entities active in the field of security and strategy. We expect DIISS to assist us in finding and implementing solutions to successfully manage challenges and crises. Though its research and educational efforts, it seeks to forward strategic thinking, contribute to conflict prevention, and promote the development of a peaceful and prosperous world. In this way, striving to anticipate new security challenges and threats and to elaborate possible methods to address them before they become critical is very important for the Institute. Uh, through successful implementation of its responsibilities, this Institute's importance is not to be limited only within Bangladesh. Uh, with globally recognized valuable research works, its reputation has the potential to go beyond the boundary of our country. We expect DISS to have such capable researchers and believe that it is working toward developing more such resource persons in the coming days. The research papers that have been presented today make, the, make me quite hopeful for our young generations who I think have the potential to work toward that end. There is growing need for research in strategic studies involving changing environment, especially in this time due to the fact that we are living in an increasingly competitive and complex global situation. Our geopolitical location as the basin country of the Bay of Bengal is a determining fact influencing our domestic and international affairs. From the viewpoint of various strategic and economic perspectives, the geopolitical significance of the Bay of Bengal can be analyzed. We welcome more such creative research papers in the future. Strategic research is an approach to gaining valuable strategic insights. When a government has to deal continuously with global security and economic issues, obtaining in-depth data and driven facts based the insights on current trends and analysis on a wide range of international security and political risk spectrums to take timely decisions has both short and long-term impact on, on the government and the country. In present global realities, our researchers in BISS need to understand that the field of strategic studies needs to recognize more fully the global roots of strategic thinking and action and incorporate these non-Western perspectives also. The rise of new actors, notably India and China, or both intellectual and policy challenges which require more informed thinking. In, the, in this changing world, the field must adapt uh, to a truly global outlook if it is to remain relevant. Relatedly, there is a need to move beyond the dominance of American or British perspectives. In recent days, Cold War is reappearing and forcing polarization. In the Indo-Pacific region in particular, attempts are being made to polarize the region. In Myanmar, that nationals are being deprived of their inalienable 
rights, partly because of sustained venom of hatred against them as an ethnic minority. Newer groups and blocks are coming up in the Indo Pacific area, rising global temperature, increasing climatic devastations in the Indo Pacific region, and its impact on Bangladesh and the region, fear of radicalism and security risks, prospect of receiving means of implementation for implementing SDG, both technology transfer and finance of money, challenges of graduation from LDC, etc. All are burning issues, and I hope BIISS can undertake and advise the government accordingly. Ladies and gentlemen, strategy search backed by facts and insights can help government to plan and implement a survival and growth strategies. It assists us in understanding hidden opportunities from multiple perspectives, such as geopolitical situations, a nation's inclinations and principles, its political alignment strategies, etc. Also, strategic research offers growth strategies that enable leaders to make informed economic decisions. An innovative institute and access to strategic insights can tremendously assist uh, the government to take clever clever decisions to avoid an economic debacle or even an impending war. BIISS publications are needed to be read by key decision makers and commented upon and, comment, uh, and commented upon within the governments at the cabinet level. The range of BIISS publication is conveying power and a strong international policy perspective can make it a key factor in the global strategic region. We have to remember that the great powers enjoy strong research and think tanks. Therefore, we also have to take efficient steps uh, in terms of research and education in the field of strategic studies. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Bangladesh Institute of International Strategic Studies uh, is a well-known research organization in South Asia. BIISS is working relentlessly for the nation and providing research input, which is helping the government in many ways for formulation of policy and maintaining relationships with the international communities and organizations. The foreign ministry expects more innovative research activities along with traditional ones in the field of ongoing economic turmoil and uncertainty. In addition, I hope that our BIISS will also look into the new opportunity that is coming up. Particularly, I would like to mention, you might have seen that the UAE is, has come up with a big project for afforestation, mangrove afforestation, uh, for the, helping the climate change. Same with the Saudi Arabia. Not only that, as I understand from newspapers, and I would hope research can look into it, the Saudi Arabia is trying to develop a whole new region and city. And in order to help improve, I mean, develop a region or a city, you'll be needing a lot of expertise. So if we understand what sort of expertise, then we should try to develop a prescription recommendation for our universities so that certain universities may try to you know, develop that type of expertise. So when the market is open, we could be more competitive and catch and get the, you know, get the market. So these are certain issues which are not in commonly uh, talked about, but I think these research institutions look into those and try to grab. For example, Saudi Arabia also is trying to uh, trying to spend around forty billion dollars for climate change, and basically they would like to do a lot of afforestations, and not only in the whole of Middle East but also in the African continent. This is a big project they're coming up. They have announced it. So maybe we should look into that and try to see how we can fit into it and help achieve our goals at the same time the global goals. The foreign ministry expects more innovative research activities along with traditional ones. Uh, with impending global climatic, political and economic crisis, its role will be greater than ever in our decision making. We in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs stands ready in this regard to extend any assistance and cooperation that is necessary to further enrich this institution and, if, and is for its global recognition. 
that may benefit not only Bangladesh, but other countries in the world. I must admit, and thank the chair, chairperson, because recently uh, there is a debate about the Quad and the Indo-Specific Economic Forum. Uh, to understand the issue in depth, we have requested the BIIS to look into it, and I'm thankful to them. They have uh, submitted one report on the uh, Indo-Specific Economic Forum, its pros, cons, and uh, whether it would be good for Bangladesh to join or not. So I am thankful to that. We are look, working on it at this time. Joy Bangla, Joy Bangla Buddha, long name Bangladesh. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, for your statement, the statement was not only a uh, very comprehensive, uh, but uh, it, uh, it, it gave us a uh, general guidance as to where BS should be heading. What are the areas that uh, should be of our interest? I can only say that uh, uh, through our, our uh, presentations uh, to, uh, during this day, what we have tried and and we have shown that that. Uh, we deal with issues of contemporary interest, inter, uh, issues which are relevant for Bangladesh, issues which have got implication, uh, be it in a regional uh, bilateral context, be it in a uh, global context, uh, we, uh, uh, context. We do know the, uh, the challenges that we are uh, facing and the evolving global situation and how it is going to impact us. So these are the areas certainly broadly uh, is under our uh, under radar, but uh, very clear uh, the directions and uh, advice uh, uh, from you as to how much more innovative this institute could be, and and how can we build our uh, own uh, relevance, uh, not only uh, in the academic world, but also uh, at, at the policy level. We are very grateful for your uh, words of appreciation. Uh, for the work we do, and uh, this is not only uh, a huge uh, encouragement, but uh, gives us the confidence to carry our work in a much more fo focused and uh, um, well-directed way. Thank you very much, sir, for your time. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, for your remarks. And and with that, we will uh, come to uh, the end of our um, first session. I would like to thank all our panelists. Have contributed today. I also acknowledge our uh, Secretary West of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Shabir Ahmad Chaudhary, who has been very kind to be a part of uh, of this uh, seminar. And we have seen uh, in each and every uh, such events that we hold, uh, we have always found uh, a foreign ministry with us, and, and that was uh, equally uh, reflective of. Uh, of, of in your words, um, uh, honorable uh, foreign minister, uh, we, uh, where you have clearly uh, given us the assurance of the continuous support that you have uh, extended to us and will extend to us. We, we uh, are very grateful for that. Uh, a, a little word of advice for uh, my own uh, uh, faculty and uh, my own uh, colleagues here that we have to uh, take on board uh, the advice that we have come um, received from the Honorable Foreign Minister. And uh, we have to uh, sharpen our, uh, our focus. Uh, while uh, theoretical bases are very important, as Dr. Zahid has, has mentioned, to provide you the analytical basis for looking at things, but do not confine it to the theory because uh, people have uh, the attention span, let me put it in, in this way, uh, of, of people uh, are, are, are too short because we are overwhelmed with information. Uh, our uh, effort should be, while uh, the academic uh, work uh, is very much required, but at the same time, uh, a focus pointed and relevant uh, studies would be the one which would provide uh, input to our policymaker and guide them uh, how we can secure a, a safe uh, secure and, and, and prosperous Bangladesh, the Bangladesh that we, the Bangabundu has dreamt of, and the Bangladesh which is being transformed by, under the leadership of the Honorable um, Prime Minister. Uh, with the word, uh, we can conclude this session. 
and invite you uh, to a lunch. Thank you very much. Present on five decades of national security of Bangladesh, evolving nature and policy options. Mr. Nahyan Raja Sabriyat, research officer, will present his paper titled Cyberspace and National Security, a Framework for Critical Infrastructure Protection in Bangladesh. And finally, Ms. Aisha Binti Tawhid, research officer, will deliver on Taiwan as a flashpoint in US-China competition, implications of a fallout in Bangladesh. The presentations will be followed by an open discussion session. The second session will be chaired by General Mohammad Abdul Mubin, SBP and DC PhD retired, former Chief of Army Staff, Bangladesh Army. He previously served as the Director General of BIISS from February 2003 to March 2004. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everybody, and uh, welcome to the second session of today's colloquium. As I was told, this is the first of its kind in the history of BIISS. Great kudos, and I'm so happy to be part of this first colloquium of BIISS. We have three papers to be presented, and as already stated by the master of the ceremony, I would request the first presenter, M. Ashik Rahman, to speak on the five decades of national security of Bangladesh, evolving nature, and policy options. Uh, thank you, sir, for giving me the floor. Uh, respected chair of the session, uh, my dear fellow panelists, uh, respected director general, and distinguished guests, assalamu alaikum and very good afternoon. So, as you can see, uh, the topic of my presentation is five decades of national security of Bangladesh. Uh, evolving nature and policy options. So, what uh, I going I am going to uh, do in this uh, research uh, that I want to present in front of you. Uh, it's an ongoing research, so uh, comments and uh, are very much welcome, and I uh, intend to get uh, good comments. Uh, so, outline of my presentation uh, is basically what I'm going to do is to discuss a little bit about the evolution of the concept of security itself, uh, uh, how the uh, understanding of security and national security evolved over the years, and then how uh, the scholars of Bangladesh and uh, uh, security stakeholders of Bangladesh, they conceive security in the context of Bangladesh and especially the national security. So what is the opinion of the epistemic community in Bangladesh over the last five decades? The third thing is uh, when uh, the discussion was going on among the scholars, so what is the uh, role of the government? I mean, what sort of policies government has been undertaking over the last five decades? So that would be the, another focus of the study. And finally, uh, if I will try to make some uh, policy suggestions uh, to the uh, stakeholders, especially to the government. So if I start with the understanding of the concept of security and national security, I, I, I think we all agree that uh, the un concept of security is one of the most evolving concept in international relations uh, in general and security studies in particular. And the evolution has occurred, the evolution has occurred over the last uh, five, seven decades from traditional understanding of security to non-traditional understanding of security in the uh, starting from the late 70s, early 80s, and then there has been, uh, again, a re redefinition of security in the post-Cold War period. And then uh, in the mid-90s, the mid we have this understanding of uh, a new approach, the human security approach, uh, where, uh, you know, the whole uh, understanding about the referent object has been transformed, you know, the referent ob object has been transformed from uh, state to individual. Uh, I
I, I had a number of definitions, but uh, I can see that definition is a slide. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, just a little bit of uh, uh, hitch in there. Uh, okay, uh, I think it's legible, hopefully. Uh, so if you look at the definitions, uh, I have uh, given the definitions and uh, ER, uh, I mean, I also highlighted when these definitions were given. So you can see how the understanding of security uh, has evolved over the years. I mean, uh, during the uh, Second World War, it was basically national security where you know, military security, state security, war, those were the main focus then. Uh, that, that continued un, until the 1960s. Uh, and uh, in the later part of the 1960s, what we saw is the re-understanding, re-definition of security where uh, the first person like, uh, you know, the former vice, former president of World Bank, McNamara, come up with a, a new definition that where he says that security means development and then goes on. Uh, and then uh, in the early 80s, we have seen a number of definitions where this understanding of non-traditional security, one of the greatest scholar, Ken Booth, he uh, talked about uh, emancipation and security, and then uh, Mohammed Ayub, who mentioned about both internal and external securities. Uh, but while this non-traditional understanding of security was going on, it does not mean that the traditional understanding was in the backside, it was going on, and there are scholars like Stephen Walt and uh, Luciani, who has who have been continuously, uh, you know, giving emphasis on the understanding of uh, uh, national security from traditional sense. So I think this is uh, nothing to uh, drag upon. I think most of us know about all this conceptual evolution. So let's see uh, what happens in case of Bangladesh. But before that, I just want to make one point. It is important to note that uh, this whole evolution of security is also possible because of the evolution of the international relations theories. I mean, if you uh, if you uh, are a realist or a, uh, you know a scholar of uh, who believes in liberalism, uh, you cannot think of human security. I mean, if you are a realist or a liberalist, the state is your uh, sole actor. So this uh, evolution of theories in international relations, where we Trans we uh, evolve from realism to liberalism and then constructivism that includes critical security studies and all those things that actually prompted these kinds of evolution in the uh, understanding of security studies. So let's see what happens in case of Bangladesh. Uh, a, a little bit of uh, limitations. Uh, it's not an exhaustive list of uh, uh, all the literatures that exist on uh, security of Bangladesh. I have. Uh, tried, uh, but definitely, uh, if I miss uh, one or two, uh, please uh, enlighten me, and I'll be happy to include those. Uh, so, a brief review of the existing literature about Bangladesh's security studies uh, shows that there has been a conceptual understanding of the national security in Bangladesh, uh, but mostly focus on elaborate discussion on various security threats and concerns. I have divided the whole literature on Bangladesh security into five uh, time period. Uh, immediately after independence, then during the period of 1980s, then in the post Cold War period, and uh, uh, in the 90 uh, in the in the uh, 21st century, and uh, then a little bit uh, discussion from the contemporary times, which I uh, think is from 2009. So in the 1970s, I don't find much of 
study on Bangladesh's security, uh, but I, I think I'm lucky enough to get a, a get hold of this paper by K. Subramaniam, who uh, we all know him, and uh, very uh, early, immediately after independence, he wrote a piece on Economic and Political Weekly in May 1972, where the title was Security of Bangladesh, and where very, he has a very interesting discussion on uh, traditional security threats of Bangladesh, and uh, very interestingly, he identified Myanmar as one of the traditional security threat of Bangladesh. And uh, mm, that was his understanding, but definitely we had a very good relations with India at the time. So as a neighboring country, India was in the friendly zone. Uh, another uh, study was uh, Christopher Bateman, that was in uh, 1979, where he uh, discussed about uh, security of Bangladesh uh, from the state level approach. Uh, so it's a basically a traditional security understanding. Then uh, a couple of uh, pieces in the Asian survey, you know, Asian survey uh, in each year they publish the January, February issue is a sort of review of the Asian countries. There are a couple of right uh, articles from Bangladeshi scholars, but those are mostly focusing on the political, uh, you know, issues that we are going through the 1970s. Uh, the 1980s is the time when the understanding of security started to transform in Bangladesh, and in this case, BISS uh, uh, I, I has been the uh, in the leading uh, position. There are a couple of uh, journal articles. I mean, there are a lot of articles, but these are the more uh, relevant uh, as early as 1984, and you can see the title and uh, the author, and then 1986. And the first book, I think, uh, on security of Bangladesh it has been published by, uh, again, from BISS in 1987, Security of Small Estates. There are other uh, works by Bangladeshi scholars like Talukdar Munir Jaman sir, he wrote a, uh, a paper on security of small states in the third world. That was in 1982. Then uh, in the next uh, decade, especially after the post-Cold War period, the security understanding is completely in sync with the evolution that was going on at the global level, at the international relations understanding. So Ishtia Kosen, he wrote a uh, under a piece on management of Bangladesh national security, then challenges uh, Iftekaru Jaman sir, who is now the uh, executive director of TIB, challenges to security of Bangladesh, primacy of the political and economic, uh, socioeconomic, so basically focusing on the non-traditional aspects of security. And then we, again from BSS, we published a number of books. Uh, as you can see, Human Covid uh, edited books in 2000, and then our uh, former director general, the uh, session of the chair, uh, he himself edited a book uh, with Human Covid 25 years of BSS and anthology published in June 20, 2003. Uh, but all this in an anthology and to celebrate the 25 years of these, but most of the uh, chapters uh, were about security of Bangladesh. And then we published an, uh, three volume uh, books on uh, Bangladesh national security that was in 2007, this is a series of publication from the ISS, 2007, 2008, and 2009. And if you look at the chapters of those books, uh, we uh, try to uh, cover both the traditional and the non-traditional security threats. And uh, the, the understanding of non-traditional and human security approach was completely there. And all the issues of non-traditional and security, human security uh, issues were all discussed in those books. And the uh, final uh, literature I go, I will mention here is about Prof, uh, you know, Shahidul Anam Kansar, that was Good Governance and National Security, uh, again published in BISL Journal 2010. This is again not the exhaustive list as I mentioned earlier, uh, just to indicate how understanding of security evolved in Bangladesh uh, among the scholars, among the epistemic community. So, what is the situation at the government level? How government uh, adjusted or uh, took initiatives to accommodate this transformation. Uh, the first uh, government uh, document is the national defense policy. Uh, we know that uh, there was a national defense policy immediately after independence, uh, but it was like uh, not much implemented. And then in the, uh, in the 2010, the whole uh, after our military government came to power, there was a lot of discussion about defense policy. So there was uh, a revision of the national defense policy, and it was adopted in uh, 2018, uh, if I'm not wrong. And then 
uh, the government has come up with the national social security strategy into 2015. I think that is a government effort to accommodate all these transformation, I mean, the non-traditional security approach and the human security approach. Then in 2014, the government came up with another strategy, the national cyber security strategy of Bangladesh, although uh, there has been a negotiation discussion going on to revise the strategy uh, and a new strategy about, I mean, a new cybersecurity strategy is uh, uh, in discussion uh, for 20, 2021 to 2025, but it has not, has not been finalized yet. There are a number of high level committees, for example, uh, but th those are mostly formed to uh, address uh, issues like terrorism, where uh, there is a high level committee where prime minister is the uh, chair of the uh, committee, and then there is also a ministerial level committee where uh, Home Minister is the chair of the committee, and they basically uh, carry out the coordination roles. So uh, I, I'm not uh, going to uh, make an assessment of the, all these policies. This is just to show that uh, the government is more or less in line with this transformation of security understanding, but still there remains certain uh, more things to do. There, I want to make some policy suggestions. First one is the, you know, if you look at the uh, at the research, at the, you know, the journal articles, the book chapters that have mentioned, most of the papers they have started with this line that Bangladesh is a developing weak state, Bangladesh is a small state, those kind of statements. But of course, those are like uh, before the 21st century. In, so. Still, I mean, uh, we are still, there are some, uh, you know, uh, this understanding uh, should be there that we need to come out of this kind of construction of uh, Bangladesh that uh, now we no longer uh, belong to those kind of uh, categorization. And we need to make a choice between traditional and non-traditional security. I, I raise this point because when I look at the literature, especially in the 1980s and 1990s, I get an impression that the authors, they have tried to make a sort of trade-off between traditional and the non-traditional. I mean, uh, uh, giving emphasis more on the non-traditional security or giving more emphasis on the human security. My point is that we do not need to make a, a trade-off sort of thing. We, we need to give equal emphasis to the to both kind of security because both are very important and the very recent uh, border incident in Bangladesh is, uh, is a very, uh, important testimony to the fact that we need to give equal importance to both uh, kinds of uh, security understanding. Uh, that is the third point again. And uh, finally, need to devise sectoral policies, just like we have like a cyber security strategy. We need to uh, this kind of policy or strategy for other sectors. For example, we have been, there has been a lot of discussions on a national security strategy for terrorism, but we have not yet, we have not been able to come up with, we have not been able to adopt a national security strategy uh, for terrorism. So those kind of sectoral policies we need. And then uh, it's also time for, we may think of, or we may start the discussion of having a national security strategy like the, you know, the countries like USA or many other developed countries have uh, uh, overall uh, national security strategy paper or strategy policy we can think of. Uh, a, a small point, when I was looking for the policies, you know, defense policy, uh, I don't find any, any uh, it's not open, it's not public, it's confidential. So I think the government need to uh, do a little bit work here to make those, those public. So we know that there are a lot of confidential aspects, so maybe an, a public version, a uh, little bit of average version can be available so that the scholars, academics, they can see and have a discussion and make, uh, uh, analyze, make assessment, and also uh, make certain policy recommendations. And finally, this uh, issue of uh, National Security Council, it has been discussed for long, for last 20, 25 years. I mean, if you look at the uh, research or uh, articles or book chapters of, in, in, of 1990s and the later part, you will see in every uh, book, every research, at the recommendation part, there is a recommendation for National Security Council. And I did not know that while I was doing this research, I come to know that there was a National Security Council formed in Bangladesh in 1982 by uh, President Sattar, uh, in that included nine members. Uh, include, uh, President Sattar was the chair of the uh, committee and then uh, chief, three chiefs, uh, three army chiefs, chiefs of the three uh, defense forces were member. So, but later it was 
uh, it was not functional or the government gave up. So I think we can we can uh, uh, rethink about this uh, council and have a national security council so that there are some uh, time we see that what we see that the government uh, you know when there is a issue related to security sometimes there is a you know a sort of hesitance uh, among the government and among the stakeholders to uh, about what to do and how to go forward uh, so that's all from my side thank you thank you ashik uh, uh, as we all know we have started a little late the second session so i would request the speakers to kindly stick to the allotted time uh, we have heard about the debate on national security strategy and it is an evolving subject i being a practitioner of traditional security all my professional life have not lost sight of the the larger spectrum of national security set strategy so ashik he has uh, placed certain issues those need to be studied in depth and then we can come to a sort of a formulation of a paper at a appropriate time but this is a ongoing study and a subject which will be there on a the table for many many years i as the former dg base was doing the same thing 30 years ago today i'm hearing the same subject being discussed on this inside this hall uh, in the similar line uh, this is not discouraging debate and discussions are very good and healthy thank you very much ashik i'll now request the second speaker mr nahyan to present his paper cyberspace and national security a framework for critical infrastructure protection in bangladesh Respected Chair of the Station, uh, respected um, Chairman Sir and Director General Sir of the IISS, uh, distinguished panelists, excellencies, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my uh, paper on cyberspace and national security, a framework for critical infrastructure protection in Bangladesh. As my previous speakers have already mentioned how we have been in a platform of evolving concepts re regarding national security, as well as traditional and non-traditional security, here comes a new era that we are calling the hybrid security space. And we are conceptualizing the hybrid uh, cyber security or cyberspace. And this is why this discussion is very much relevant. I should not spend much time on the background. So here is the outline, as you can see on the screen. Um, please have a look on it. I should move to the next uh, portion as well. So before conceptualizing or providing you with a framework, I decided to conceptualize cybersecurity first of all. The reason is because when it comes to non-traditional security thread, it is very difficult for conceptualizing. And as you can see that I'm talking about critical infrastructure about cybersecurity. There is a common misconception about critical infrastructure or cybersecurity that it talks about critical vulnerabilities. That's not true. We talk about a theoretical situation that if this infrastructure has somehow been affected, then how it is going to affect the overall national security situation. And another situation which I'm talking about about the cyberspace and national security is the evolving space or the geopolitical space. As the speaker about maritime security in the previous session has already talked about how our conceptualization about maritime security has evolved over, over the years. When we talk about cybersecurity, we are facing a similar kind of problem because Many scholars have argued that when we talk about maritime security, we are still looking at it from the land perspective. And that's the problem I'm going to talk about cybersecurity because we are dealing with a new kind of space. But at the same time, we are dealing with cybersecurity from traditional perspectives. That's why conceptualization is needed. If you look at the screen, we see that uh, United Nations Security Council has mentioned cybersecurity as proposed solutions to the threats posed by hacking and compromising computer systems. It is uh, basically a narrow definition. So if you broaden it up, if you look at the definition provided by the International Telecommunication Unit, you see it is talking about cyber environment. Now, when we are talking about cyber environment, the concept has been broadened already. We are talking about multiple stakeholders, multiple countries, and multifaceted problems and multifaceted threats. Then when we talk about uh, country-based 
understanding. There is a definition provided by the US Homeland Security, and you can see it talks about resources, structures, and networks, either physical or electronic, so important that the loss or failure will impair security, national economic defense, national public health or safety, and combination thereof. I've highlighted both security and economic defense because we will be looking at both a market-oriented as well as security-oriented framework for critical infrastructure. Finally, here is the definition we are talking about from the Bangladesh government's uh, critical incident response team, and it provided that infrastructure that would affect the economic and national security of a country if it were negatively impacted or eliminated, as I have previously mentioned, that we are talking about a theoretical situation if it had been affected in a particular understanding. But if you look at our credentials, our portfolio in the cybersecurity or digital channel, we have been doing very good. Bangladesh has recently climbed up uh, 27 positions in the Global Cybersecurity Index, holding the first position in South Asia in 2022. But as I've mentioned already, Data sometimes can be very much manipulative and data also can be distracting. Just because we are doing very good doesn't mean that we do not need to be very secure, we do not need to be very careful about it. Because when it comes to non-traditional security threat, we do not know where the threat is coming from. For example, we, for the cybersecurity analysts, we call it the attribution problem. And for cybersecurity, attribution is a huge problem because there are multiple stakeholders and sometimes the Thread is happening by itself, which I will be discussed very soon. 29 organizations have been identified by the Digital Security Act, and these are all the uh, institutions you can see. I would say it is a very comprehensive understanding. It includes all different parts of public infrastructure, as well as uh, institutes which can uh, be affected if they were threatened. And I will move to the next part, which is basically the relation between cybersecurity and critical infrastructure. I because of the time constraints, I will just move fast forward. But you see, there is a problem. Although we are talking about non-traditional security, state is still the primary coordinator and the highest level player, as mentioned by the theorists and scholars, for guaranteeing and implementing cyber defense policy. And my previous speaker has already mentioned about the different object. Now, when we talk about the cyberspace, we need a new different object. And scholars have been debating about it a lot. But my personal understanding is that basically at the unit level, we are looking at digit. So our point is now have moved from the human security understanding to the digital security, and we have to take account of every single data. Next, the critical infrastructure, basically it's about the vital national interest, and therefore we cannot actually ignore the importance of uh, state. Another important understanding is that if you look at all the index, if you look at the way cybersecurity analysis have been developed, they basically aggregate the data based on infection or threats by per country. So if you look at per country, that also means that we should include state as a very important part of national um, critical infrastructure strategy or something like that. And there are other analyses about multiple interactions and how we should incorporate different organizations. But um, uh, and I've been talked about uh, I've been talking about research gap, which is that we do not have enough literature from South Asian authors. So I felt the need to have a study from non-Western perspectives. And when I talk about non-Western perspective, I am basically talking about South Asia, particularly because if you look at the South America, they have been developing different kinds of literature about critical infrastructure as well as cybersecurity. So basically, we need to work on it, the South Asian scholars. And here are my research objectives and research questions. You see, my uh, basically, my question is, how can Bangladesh protect SCI from cyber threat? Now, the, here is a methodology that is primarily a qualitative uh, research, and I've used both primary and secondary data. I've used KIIs and journal articles, reports, and different kinds of um, uh, materials. Now, here is the proposed framework. This is why I have moved so fast, because I think this is the crucial part. So it has been developed with the help of different understanding or frameworks. Basically, I took inspiration from the framework provided by Leo Tabanski, as well as Deborah J. Uh, uh, Deborah J. Bodio. And they are working in two different countries. One is right now uh, participating in Tel Aviv. Another person is working in the United States. But I have taken different elements from their uh, uh, proposed strategies or the analysis, and I have developed this strategy for Bangladesh. You see, I feel the importance that strategic agility and preparedness state should be at the topmost level because state is still the primary coordinator in this level. But 
still, we need the community level understanding, we need the institutional level, and we need, we need unit level analysis. I'm going to analyze the framework soon. So when we talk about technical defense, I guess uh, SCADA is the most common word we use. It is about supervisory control and data acquisition. And most importantly, we use it for power grid or uh, power development system. My interviews with the power development board authorities and uh, other people who are working on it. Uh, I've, under I've understood that we have been using SCADA basically since the 1990s, but we are still in a implementation process. So we are now going through the optical fiber implementation and gradually developing to it. But SCADA is being used in different parts of our power development, for example, in Chittagong, in Kulna, in Moimoshingho, and in Kumilla. So all these different areas are using SCADA already. But um, just to give you an example of why SCADA is so much important, why the supervisory control is important, very recently we had a power outage around the first week of November, and we have all felt it, that there is a power grid situation. But it was not a cyber hack. This is why we need to focus on it, because cybersecurity problems can take place by itself. So that's why we call it the attribution problem. You see, there is a term called interdiction. And interdiction basically refers to a situation where uh, we have this understanding that machine learning process learns by itself. So if a machine learns to actually combat the virus or combat the threat itself, it can also learn to delay the risk uh, determination process as well as the combating process. So machine actually can be our basic protection formulation point as well our, as our basic threat. Then we need the importance of real-time monitoring and detection. Many countries have been using it. Um, I've seen the example of Italy and the city of Rome they have mostly been using and it's been used for traffic systems. And for critical infrastructures, for example, in the airport or any other uh, important security area, traffic control system can be very important, not only basically for controlling the traffic movement, but also to detect which kind of vehicles, which kind of, um, uh, which kind of you know, goods they are carrying. And then we have to utilize the AI power tools and make the simulations. Those are basically part of technical defense. And when we talk about AI power tools, we can actually talk about both slow formulations and long-term formulations of AI power tools. But AI-generated strategies can also give us a basic understanding of how future strategies can be developed, because as I have already told that machine learning system learns by itself. Next point, we have the critical information protection. And here I feel the importance of institution comes up. Uh, I think uh, some of these issues are overlapping and they should be binded together. For example, encryption and cryptography, it is very common understanding. We all use passwords and we know how passwords are very important. Even when we enter the office, we use the fingerprint lock. But at the same time, this is the data we are channeling to the world. Anybody can use it. These data have to be encrypted and very uh, much important as well as cryptography. Then comes the importance of energy consumption, because now we are debating about other non-traditional security issues, which are also very relevant, for example, climate change. And we see in different parts of the world, for example, Malaysia in the United States, how the understanding of energy security, how the understanding of climate change have together come up with the issue of NFT and maintaining um, the huge uh, infrastructure of critical infrastructure. Next point is that maintaining a vulnerability database and also cyber insurance in both these areas, we need the intervention of research. And as a researcher, I think I need to highlight it because um, in Bangladesh or in even any other country, we actually do not have any vulnerability database for cybersecurity or critical infrastructure. As an, organ as an organization, these actually can start it. Any other organization can start it. We can do it together because it will be a huge data. But any of the critical infrastructure authority, any of the ownership, can be benefited from this vulnerability database. And finally, cyber insurance. Now it's a very critical point because our cyber insurance understanding is at the first level, which is basically providing insurance to institutions and people. But we need to move towards the third party uh, understanding where government is actually seeking for the protection. Because when you talk about national security, the whole data of the nation, the whole data of the government has also to be insured. Bangladesh government in the Digital Security Act has issue, issued the authority of the CIRD basically for providing the cyber capacity and cyber uh, or protection different kinds of. Now I think the next task of ours will be to identify other stakeholders who can, who can be incorporated in this process. The third point, basically I have just one slide left, it's the responsive resilience. 
Um, uh, now we are talking about maintaining the supply chain, and it can be based on country, it can be based on channel, but the cybersecurity supply chain has to be taken very seriously because when it comes to device, when it comes to IT sector, and now we are moving towards trillion dollar sectors for ITs, and gradually we are developing towards that. So the cybersecurity supply chain has to be authentically developed. But you know, it's also about the production companies, um, the very uh, a very popular company called Apple. They have this MF certification, which is certification of other companies who are authentic for using Apple-related accessories, which includes charger and other devices. And if you look at um, countries uh, like Albania, they have a fine, uh, they have finalized a very interesting system, which is electronic certification for critical infrastructure elements. And what they do that the government certifies different kind of accessories, different softwares, different hardwares, which will not ultimately affect the critical infrastructure. So I think we can do that. Packet switching is another uh, very important issue, and it's basically just moving or transitioning a particular kind of data altogether, which is very crucial to that sector. And at district and local levels, as I have already mentioned, for example, uh, in the power sector, we have in different districts our power grids. And we have to, if we take into account that power switching, if one part being, is being affected, the other parts can be separated and we can actually reduce the effect of cyber threat. The next thing is that although we talk about it has become a buzzword that automation is taking our jobs, but at the same time, we need alternatives for human centric operations because ultimately there is going to be no alternative for humans. So whenever there is a situation uh, re related to the uh, cyber security infrastructure threat, we can actually then depend on the human centric um, understanding. And finally, our government has taken into account training and awareness building. And it is very important. And now we are talking about cyber gyms. And uh, I think um, a very important type of research funding has been allotted in the recent government initiatives. And this cyber gym can actually build up training awareness and more researchers uh, in the future. The finer and the core domain, which is going to be the state-centric domain, is basically maintaining the strategic agility and uh, just coordinating all this understanding. I am not going to just focus on each of the parts, but I think there are two uh, very important things. The final one is cyber diplomacy and private public private partnership. These are all self-explanatory, but the focus on cyber diplomacy needs to be flagged because this is a new kind of diplomacy. And if you look at particular countries which we have not been uh, in discussion before, for example, the Lao PDR and Samoa, these are the countries we do not see very often in terms of understanding. But we are moving towards a new uh, kind of diplomacy. Uh, on November 3rd, we had a, a very big conference with UN SCAP. And there we talked about how our future of digital security and digital understanding can be formulated with the help of with the help of Thailand and Samoa. So these are the countries we are not looking forward to. We need um, estimation and cost analysis. We need inclusion into legal and policy domains. And very happily, I would say that our uh, Digital Security Act, it actually includes in its chapter five, the critical infrastructure, and as well as in chapter seven, uh, the uh, punishable offenses and how we are going to tackle the uh, critical infrastructure related offense. Uh, this is my chance to wait for a final slide, and I think uh, there were some uh, issues which have already been discussed in my slides. But here is a very important quote, which uh, uh, which is a common quote in uh, the cybersecurity understanding: "We have to think beyond guns, gates, and guards." So this is the new beginning of cybersecurity. This is the new beginning of cyber world. We have to look forward. We are now looking towards the smarter Bangladesh, and smarter Bangladesh actually requires more qualitative understanding, both vertical and horizontal development and more and more research in this field. Thank you so much for patiently listening to my work. Thank you very much, Nahayan. All very new and rare jargons used in this uh, particular presentation. This is a virgin domain for me, particularly. Thank you once again. Now we'll have the last paper presenter, Aisha Bintu Tawhid. Taiwan is a flashpoint in US-China competition implications of a fallout in Bangladesh. Uh, thank you, sir. I respect the chair of the session, respect the chairman and director general of the ISS and esteemed guests. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning. Very good afternoon, sorry. Today I shall be presenting my ongoing research on the topic. Taiwan as a flashpoint in US-China competition, 
implications of a potential fallout in Bangladesh. So first, a brief about the introduction of my paper. So we all know that the Taiwan issue is an unresolved issue from the Chinese Civil War that continues to impact the cross trade relation, the US-China competition, and it also holds the potential uh, to disrupt the regional stability and have global consequences. Both the US and China wants to see a peaceful re a resolution to the Taiwan question, but they have different interpretations of the topic. This has filled the issue filled with complexity, uncertainty, and prone to miscalculations. So when we talk about US-China competition in Bangladesh, we have a, a good number of literatures coming up. We have been discussing how US-China competition is evolving in the Bay of Bengal, like my colleague discussed in the morning session. We are also discussing this competition in the Indian Ocean region and also part of the broader new strategic, uh, new geographical formation of the Indo-Pacific region. So, but when it comes to discussing of clash points and with relevance to Bangladesh, this area is uh, quite understudied. And this is where my research uh, is, uh, is hopefully going to fill that gap of connecting a clash point with relevance to Bangladesh. So I have three research questions. Uh, first, why is Taiwan considered a clash point in US-China competition? Second, will there be an escalation center in Taiwan? If so, what are the probable scenarios? And three, what are the implications of a potential fallout in Bangladesh? Now, to answer the first question, I'll be basing my analysis on two key arguments. One, the difference uh, among the relevant parties on their ideological viewpoint. And second, on the strategic value of Taiwan for both the United States and China. So first, discussing about the different positions. So when we talk about China, we see that Taiwan is uh, considered to be a sacred territory of the PRC, and it is a sacred duty to achieve the great reunification. It is embedded in the Chinese constitution and also identified as one of the four interests of China. China believes in one China principle and sees the peaceful reunification under one China, two systems as the only acceptable solution. So although we know that uh, China uh, is uh, talking about peaceful reunification, but at the same time, owing to the changes in the domestic situation inside Taiwan, it has hardened its position over the years. For example, it takes a very strong position against Taiwan independence and separatist forces, and also the interference of external bodies inside the island. And for that purpose, they have promulgated the anti-secession law, which indicates the possibility to use non-peaceful means under specific conditions to protect the China's sovereignty and territorial integrity. And recently, we have seen the discussion surrounding the Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit and the white paper that came afterwards, which reflected that Taiwan would never renounce the use of, the, sorry, the PRC would never renounce the use of force and take all necessary measures to protect Taiwan. So now the position of China is very much subjected to the political parties that are ruling inside Taiwan. For example, when Taiwan underwent democratization in the 1990s, there was turbulent relationship in the cross strait. However, in 2008, when the PNP government came in power, there was a, some sort of stability and institutional dialogue between the both sides. But again, in 2016, when the DPP resumed power, the cross trade relations escalated, and the DPP has been constantly calling for defending democracy and sovereignty of the island. That has put uh, China and Taiwan in very conflicting, conflicting positions. Now, it is very important to understand what does the United States view it. So we all know officially uh, the United States since the 1970s approach more uh, with the uh, PRC, it believes in the one China policy, which is the official recognition of PRC as the sole legitimate government of China. However, uh, US, US's understanding of the one China is very different from the interpretation of the Chinese version of the one China principle. So this is very interesting in this regard, if you see closely that the USA acknowledges the Chinese position that Taiwan was a part of China, but it does not recognize Chinese sovereignty over Taiwan. I know this is a bit of a complication, and this is one of the reasons why there are so many uncertainties surrounding USA's positions on, on Taiwan. So under the Taiwan Relations Act, USA supports the, the self-defense capability of Taiwan, and it also maintains the uh, capacity to resist any sort of use of force against the island. However, again, a very compl uh, complicated part, although it maintains the capacity, it does not commit that it will come to uh, uh, Taiwan's defense. And that is why the strategic ambiguity uh, concept has come into place over the years. Different US administration have maintained that, which is a purposeful uncertainty 
about the conditions or of nature of possible US intervention in a case of conflict between China and Taiwan. So these are the two areas that are very critical to understand why there are so many complexities in addressing the Taiwan issues and the kind of escalation that we are seeing in recent times. So now, of course, besides the ideological reason, the strategic importance of Taiwan is very important to take note of. So first, Taiwan is a part of the first island chain, which is a hypothetical strategy that was formulated in the 1940s by USA to contain the USSR and China, and it still remains relevant till present. But for China to have a position on the, um, the, the first island chain is by taking over Taiwan, it would allow it to break, break uh, this island chain and project power eastwards, which will fundamentally alter the strategic balance of the Western Pacific, which is a very concerning situation for the United States. And second, it also allows both parties to maintain influence in the region, particularly in the South China Sea and also in, in Japan and the East China Sea. Third, it, uh, we all have been hearing about Taiwan's dominance in the global semiconductor and advanced chip industry. So we all know semiconductor is very important for all electronic devices we use. However, it also has a military dimension in of, of it. So for example, all the advanced different systems, and especially when we talk about AI use in uh, military technology, ESMC holds a very crucial position. So for the United States, it is very important to maintain its supply chain through TSMC, because if that is cut off, USA is at risk of losing its military and technological domain, uh, dominance. And at the same time, for this particular reason, it is considered as a part of USA's national security concern. And it is predicted in DOD reports that any adversary who is able to cut off the supply chain would have an upper hand in all domains of warfare. So strategically, the TSMC is very important for both the China and the United States. And fourthly, the Taiwan Strait is one of the busiest lines of communication. If you see the image down, you can see like it is very important for that region to conduct trade with the United States, Europe, and all destinations in between. And lastly, it is this flashpoint is very important determiner of how the regional security order is evolving, whether or not the US-led liberal hegemonic order is maintained in this region and the security infrastructures and architectures that has been set up. And for China, it is important that resolving the Taiwan issue in its own term would give the uh, PRC an uh, edge over all the strategic uh, equations in this region and a better parity in its relation with USA and in the Indo-Pacific. So these regions, uh, these reasons make uh, the Taiwan issue so valuable for both uh, the United States and the PRC. Now, if you talk about crisis escalation, which is answering my second research question, that if we are talking about an escalation, what are the probable ways? So first, if you're in, envisioning uh, the Chinese campaign, so over the years, different American uh, strategies have come up with different ideas of how they perceive that the uh, PRC would be using force against Taiwan. So in that regard, it can start in different manners. It can be through the stabilization techniques in the cross uh, in the Taiwan Strait. It can take a form of different sort of blockades, joint missile strikes, counter intervention if external forces are coming to Taiwan's aid, and then finally a prediction of an all-out uh, war, maybe through seaboard invasion on the offshore islands or the island of Taiwan as a whole. So there are different sort of campaigns that are perceived. However, 10 years before, when these campaigns were perceived, there were a lot of a dilemma or kind of questioning whether or not uh, China is able to conduct this magnitude of a campaign. But if you read the literature of recent time, there has been a lot of suggestions that the PRC in the last decade has made unparalleled advancements in its military domain, and it is very much capable of doing so. So that's why the uh, discussions of the uh, PRC using force has been a predominant uh, thing in the security st strategic field. Now, what happens if there is an escalation from China's side? How does the US and its allies respond? So, of course, the first line would be sanctions. However, we need to keep in mind that sanctions on uh, China would be very different from the kind of sanctions we have seen, for example, in Russia or any other country because of China's very intricate link with the global economy. But we are already starting to see different forms of sanction based on Chinese entities and uh, personnel on human rights issues. So if the escalation, uh, the crisis escalates, there are likely to be more sanctions placed on uh, China. 
And second, uh, the USA would, of course, uh, intensifying its uh, arms supply and training in Taiwan. And thirdly, it is very important that any move over Taiwan would heighten the insecurities of the other countries that share territorial disputes or see China as an assertive country. So it is likely to shift the uh, uh, coalitions, for example, Quad from a non-security towards a more securitized version of Quad. Perhaps we can be also looking at a more extended version of Quad with additional members of these like-minded countries uh, taking membership of Quad. We are also can be looking at a more extended AUKUS. And also in the last US NSF, there were talks about coalitions among like-minded partners. So we are also likely to some scenarios of coalitions building around this region to contain uh, China. And fourth, of course, there would be deterrent options deployed by the United States. And lastly, uh, the question, the big question that whether or not US would be actively engaging to defend Taiwan, it still remains ambiguous. Over the recent months, I think in uh, the US President uh, Biden has given out certain statements which kind of uh, made us, the like, scholars like us question that is the USA moving from a strategic ambiguity to a strategic clarity. However, the official position remains the same, and it is uh, still very difficult to predict whether or not there would be an active engagement of, of USA regarding Taiwan. Now, it is very important to understand now that we have discussed like how this scenario is going to develop, how will it impact countries like Bangladesh? So very fundamentally, we uh, adhere to the one China policy. And over the last few months, in all official statements, our foreign ministry have reiterated its position in different uh, meetings with Chinese officials. So there is no doubt about our policy on this regard. However, this escalation of competition and crisis is going to bring newer challenges for us, which we need to take into consideration. So first, it is going to be a very uh, difficult task to navigate through this intensifying competition between the United States and China. No doubt about that. We have been talking about it quite a bit. We are already experiencing difficulties. However, as things escalate more, we are going to have more and more difficulties because we are talking, we're looking at competing initiatives like IPS, GSI, and more coalition formation around this region, which would make our foreign policy choices very difficult in the coming days. And second, we are also looking at polarization between the democracy and autocracy. So if you look closely in the US documents that has been coming out, they regard the Taiwan issue as it's defending democracy and upholding rules-based order in the Indian Ocean region. So gradually, there are going to be more polarization along the line of democracy versus autocracy. So it is going to put countries like ours who believe in a non-aligned approach in quite a, a dilemma because as a democratic country, we would want to be part of a democratic uh, principles and uh, advocating for democracy, but at the same time, uh, by our foreign policy orientation, we want to stay non aligned. So, how do we navigate through this growing complexity is something that we should be monitoring closely. Third is regarding our defense cooperation. So, we all know that uh, our largest defense cooperation is with China, and we have been extensively uh, relying on China for our defense procurements. Uh, however, if we are looking into a crisis situation and if we are looking into sanctions on um, China regarding uh, their approach towards Taiwan, it is going to be very difficult. We have seen in the case of Russia, where many nearby countries had to suspend their um, uh, military deals with Russia because transactions are very difficult with the sanction countries. And also, at the same time, there are fear of falling into secondary sanctions. So that makes it very difficult. So for countries like ours who are so dependent on China, we think under these new circumstances, how do we continue with our existing arrangements that we have with China? Because our existing stockpile, we have to then, uh, ensure that we have the enough supplies of spare parts, maintenance, and the kind of arrangements that we have in terms of training and capacity building with China. So how do we maintain that in the face of crisis is something that we should be thinking. Also, at the same time, under these new circumstances, we should be taking this opportunity to look into diversifying our defense sources for the long term. So as part of the Forces Goal 2030, we have been doing a bit already. In recently, we have diversified, started to diversify in specific areas. But I think it is about time that we take into consideration this bigger scenario that is evolving in the region and see how do we diversify thinking in a long-term manner. And at the same time, looking into the indigenous 
um, a defense production capability and doing the uh, cost benefit analysis to see of a more sustainable mode of defense arrangements. So that is something that we should do. Yes, yeah, so just last two points. Uh, um, the impact on trade is very important. And this is something that I just want to touch on because in our trade, especially in our RNG sector, which is our largest uh, segment of trade, we heavily rely on the raw materials from China and then export it to the Western market of Europe and America. However, when you're talking about the escalation of prices and restrictive uh, policies being made, it is going to be very difficult. For example, in recent times, centering the human rights condition in Xinjiang, USA imposed uh, restrictions on the cotton of uh, coming from Xinjiang. So it made our supply chain very uh, difficult and made our commerce industry very concerned. So if you're looking into more uh, escalated scenario, we need to think the dependency that we have on China on the, the raw materials, which we used to produce to the Western market. So that is something we should be uh, looking more closely. And overall, we will be having a disruption of global supply chain and also in international cooperation like climate change. So just to wrap up, sir, uh, I, in my personal opinion, I feel that the U.S.-China competition has definitely intensified, and it is going to uh, intensify even more surrounding Taiwan. Uh, however, when we talk about escalation of crisis, uh, I am not saying that this is inevitable, that uh, a war-like scenario is likely to be imminent in next a year or two. However, if you look into the ideological and the strategic value of Taiwan, we see that Losing access or losing influence over Taiwan is very is something that these two countries cannot afford to. So there will be measures to have a better influence on it, which makes these countries very eager to take risks surrounding Taiwan. That is why we are looking at uh, escalated scenarios. And for that reason, it is important for countries like ours who are dependent on both the United States and China as the two strongest partners to make sure that we are not caught in a very difficult position. So we have seen the case in Ukraine, because when we see the crisis is clear, it does not give time to respond. So if we do not start looking at this scenario very closely, we would be in a very difficult position on how do we respond and how do we avoid the shocks and surprises. With that note, I would like to end. Thank you so much for your patience, Harry. Thank you, Aisha, for your uh, perception and articulation. Uh, with that, we come to the end of the presentation by the three paper presenters. Do we have the same time for open forum or we curtail the time because we have another session after this one? Okay, we are now going to have the open discussion and I invite views, opinions and questions from the floor. Thank you, sir. Connelly Ptekar, Connelly Terry Ptekar. Uh, my question to uh, senior research fellow Ashik Rahman. Uh, this is regarding the national security. Uh, the most of the countries now are considering uh, nuclear threat is the most dangerous threat, and uh, most of the advanced countries are making uh, underground nuclear shelters. What is the alternative option for Bangladesh as per your research? And the next question to uh, Mr. Nahian, could we really protect us from another cyber attack on our banks? And my final question to uh, research officer Aisha. You said there were two questions. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the first one goes to uh, the first presenter uh, about the national security. And uh, I was just curious to know, how would you characterize the evolving nature of Bangladesh national security? Has it become, uh, is, is it, do you see a trend of pursuing a path of becoming a regional powerhouse for normative values uh, with adequate deterrence or not? And if so, how do you explain the Rohingya crisis, which is a manifestation that we are, uh, uh, we value normative, uh, we cherish the normative things, but also it has posed a destabilizing factor uh, on the security dimension. Uh, the other one is, of course, uh, on the referent object of security, as you have mentioned, uh, uh, shifting from state to individuals, which I, I believe you are mentioning about the human security aspect. And in the human security dimension, you have uh, freedom from fear and freedom from want. What do you think the national security priorities are ha has been? 
over the first uh, over the uh, last five decades uh, in which dimension got relatively higher priorities uh, and the second question is on on the cybersecurity domain uh, I think there's one correction I think it's a factual thing about if you're referring to the ITUG global uh, cybersecurity index I think the ranking of Bangladesh is 11th in the Asia Pacific region and 53rd in the global uh, which may need to be corrected uh, out of 182 countries but more fundamentally uh, do you think there is a need for uh, having an offensive cybersecurity capability in the national security uh, agendas, particularly for the fact that you have uh, has and CAD has is a uh, as you know uh, activist uh, hacking as a service which is proliferated uh, all over the world. Um, do you think an offensive element should be included uh, in that uh, strategy or not? Thank you. Let's not suggest hacking services to be provided by Bangladeshis or other countries. Thank you. Any other views, opinions, or query or questions? One thing. Oh, that's all Retired Air Commodore Ishwar. I mean, whenever we talk of Taiwan issues, you know, uh, we, I've never ever heard uh, anyone saying that the Taiwanese, what is the Taiwanese opinion? I mean, a Taiwanese, a child who was born in 1949 is now 70 plus, okay? They have never seen China. They have never seen, uh, you know, uh, uh, there was a period of autocracy, but they've never seen a communist uh, regime. And as Taiwan is now multi-party democracy and is practicing democracy, which, you know, where people can express their differing opinion. And as China is moving more and more towards an authoritarian uh, uh, dictatorial rule, far away from um, what was initially conceived as a uh, communi uh, communist, you know, uh, or even uh, Deng Xiaoping that it is, uh, as he practiced. So I think we got this, it's widening between the two. And uh, in any case, I think we should take note of the Taiwanese people. I mean, what do they think about it, their future? Thank you. May we allow the uh, presenters to make response to the queries? Uh, thank you, sir, for giving me the floor again. Uh, I think about the uh, nuclear security uh, question, uh, I think it goes with the uh, position of Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh has is at the global level, at the international level, that, uh, you know, uh, Bangladesh is in favor of uh, peaceful resolution of all kinds of disputes. So uh, we don't want any kind of fallout that uh, leads to the uh, nuclear uh, fallout or nuclear uh, um, uh, incident. Uh, if we think about, uh, I mean, uh, th take the example of the region. You know, we have uh, two regional countries who are uh, who has the nuclear uh, capability. So we always want them to resolve their disputes peacefully. But uh, if we talk about like the, uh, we now have the Rupur power plant, the nuclear power plant. So if you uh, talk about the uh, safety of the nuclear materials, the official, uh, so I think there are uh, ample uh, preparation uh, has been taken by uh, the government and by the agencies who are involved in the process and uh, the security of those materials and the security of the installations, all kinds of security measures are being uh, put in place uh, so that uh, nothing uh, serious happens. But of course there remains, uh, uh, we all always need to be prepared for that. Uh, about uh, Bangladesh's position as a norm-setting country, I think that is what my uh, sort of uh, um, suggest suggestions that we need to come up from those, uh, you know, the earlier views of Bangladesh being, uh, you know, a small state, not uh, having a larger voice in the in the global and the regional issues. Now we can have larger voice, and we are definitely, I mean, uh, by giving shelter to millions of refugees. I think we have already set a norm of humanitarian, you know, intervention or the or the uh, you know, state behaving in a humanitarian way. So uh, I think definitely Bangladesh, the position we are in now, you know, from the economic point of view or uh, you know the developed point of view, you know, being the uh, fastest growing country uh, in 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 one of the fastest growing country in the world and the fastest growing country in the region. 
Bangladesh uh, should uh, take the lead, you know, and we have seen a lot of examples, you know, the Ukraine war, we have seen how Bangladesh uh, participated at the United Nations. Uh, so definitely Bangladesh is going in that direction. Uh, about uh, the last question about the national security and the human security, where is the priority? I mean, that is one of my main argument in the recommendation part that I don't want uh, to make a trade-off or to make a competition between the national security understanding and the human security understanding. What I, uh, I mean, as a you know, so a student of security studies, my uh, position is that we need to uh, differentiate that we need to. Uh, I think uh, the understanding should be there are two different things. National security has one sort of construction, one sort of uh, uh, you know uh, policy directions, the requirements of policies. Whereas if you are, uh, want to uh, adopt human security approach, your policies would be different, your focus would be different. So you do not need to make a competition that which one to prioritize. Both are important. I mean, uh, it depends on uh, you know uh, rather than prioritizing, I think we, we need to have a more comprehensive approach. So that we we can fulfill both both the needs, you know, both to ensure your national security as well as your human security, because uh, you know they are not exclusive, and you, you don't uh, go for one at the expense of the another. Yeah. Thank you very much. Naya. Uh, thank you, sir, for the questions. Uh, first of all, I would like to address the issue of uh, banks. So, uh, so we cannot actually predict, and for that reason, we actually need an index. That's why I say research is so much important. Once we have the index, we can understand where the vulnerabilities are, and we can act upon that. That's the first reason. And the next important thing is that when the attack happened, we did not have a critical infrastructure or understanding of critical infrastructure strategy. Basically, we had an infancy level one, which was mentioned in the Bangladesh government's ECIRT uh, annual report. And those were three organizations. The first one was Tita's Gas. The next one was Bangladesh Power Development Board. And then we had just Bangladesh Bank. But if you look at the current developments, the recent draft formulated for the digital security and national cyber security, there are 29 organizations. And among, among those 29 organizations, there is not only Bangladesh Bank, but also Shonali Bank, Ogroni Bank, Jonota Bank, and all these other banks. That means we are now moving towards a more comprehensive understanding of deterring cyber attacks, because now we understand that it's not just the central bank, but also the other banks, which is important. And now um, I have been recently in India, and they are now looking forward to the digital e-governance completely going paperless, that kind of understanding. And I think that's the future for all the economics. So before going to that, I think all of the entities, all of the infrastructures are, have to be individually developed with their own cyber capacities, and then we can have a comprehensive framework for all. And also, that's why I have mentioned about cyber insurance, because we cannot predict an attack. But if that attack happens, then if we can go back to the other state, if we have that capability, that is also important. And so for the next uh, question, first of all, I would like to mention that it, uh, the data was not from ITU. Uh, the reason I did not take the data from ITU was because I, the methodology. I find this very critical when I work on cybersecurity because ITU takes a varied kind of uh, elements and issues, including communications and connectivity. And one of the challenges we feel when we work on security to separate economy, digitalization, and connectivity from one to another. That's why I took the reference from uh, e-governance uh, uh, e uh, e academy, which is an Estonia-based organization, and they basically provide real-time data on cybersecurity indices. And although it might be changed because my data was taken um, back in October and I've stopped, I've stopped taking any references after October because otherwise my sample size would be manipulated because all my other data had been taken until October, the sample uh, issues. But about, um, I think uh, the another uh, question was um, about, um, if I get right that uh, whether this uh, cyber capacity, so can you please actually repeat your question, the next question? The question was offensive cybersecurity because we are already attacked or we have been attacked. So should the, as a national priority, should this also be included as an option? Thank you, sir, for clarifying. Uh, I think the 
problem is that it is also a, going to be a public document because a cyber it, it, it is a problem that cyber security strategy or whatever strategy we have to be uploaded publicly if we take an offensive strategy publicly that is going to hamper our image first of all then we are talking about cyber diplomacy it's not very healthy for cyber diplomacy as well the next point is that if we have we can have the offensive capability but saying that offensive strategy there were two problems the first one is the attribution problem who are we going to look at? Because there are multiple stakeholders, there are business entities, there are activists, there are black markets. We cannot address all these markets and be offensive. Then our sole focus should only be um, just increasing our, um, our you, I don't see, see if there is a town called cyber armaments, but if there was, I would say that, that, that our only focus would then be on increasing cyber armaments. Then the next question will come. I'm just taking the issue from traditional security that whether there is going to be a cyber security dilemma. If we start to develop offensive security, maybe other countries will be scared that, okay, Bangladesh is now going to a very proactive stage because we are now going to digital connectivity. So I think that our primary focus should be on uh, building up defensive mechanism. And when, once we have the defensive mechanism, we can translate it to the collective security understanding. And that is very important because now we are looking at the Indo-Pacific framework or maybe BIMSTEC framework, South Asian framework. If we have this collective understanding, if all of the countries have their defensive frameworks together, then I think that can translate to a broader understanding or community-based understanding of cybersecurity. And that can be translated into an offensive strategy if needed. But I think our primary focus should be on maintaining defense, that is protect data and also to ensure our policies. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Nehan. Aisha, so is yours. Thank you, sir. So I, I think I just have one question from Ishfaq, sir, so I'll respond to that. So I understand the concern uh, when we talk about Taiwanese opinion, but it is always difficult to bring a Taiwanese opinion under a uniform banner because it is so diverse. So that is why when I discuss, I discuss the view of the two leading political parties, that is the Kumadang and the DPP. So when I think you rightly point out that about uh, the generation gap, so when we talk about the general population, there is, of course, this evident of the generation which has memories of before 1949 and the generation which do not have any memories. So that is what defines the identity, either it's a dual identity or a single identity that they are comfortable in using. So there is a mixed view on that. So there are a few statistics on whether or not that this identity is changing over time. But of course, uh, because it's uh, just based on a set, a small sample size, we cannot uh, label it as a generalized view. But when it comes to the official Taiwanese position, I think so. This is very much subjected to the ruling party that is in power. For example, if we see uh, the government in dating, uh, I think President Lee in '96. Uh, if we talk about the President Chen's government in 2001, they had a very different approach of how they want to see the cross trade relation and how they interpret the One China policy. Uh, the 1992 consensus as well. But if we see in recent times, we see the present government, the uh, DPP government under President Tsai, they have a very strong uh, position which is different from the other political parties. So that is why when we talk about the cross street relation, so it's very difficult to come uh, to see the Taiwanese as one uniform opinion. So that is why when we discuss, we discuss through the parties, but I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry we have overshot the time, so I'll cut short my personal views. I would like to thank the paper presenters for the articulation and expression of views in a very eloquent manner. Thank you very much. And to the enlightened audience for their inputs and views and queries. Uh, <clears throat> since my time in this great institution about 20 years ago, Prof. has seen me here, Sarah has seen me here before, we have had a lot of discourse on national security. I think we are still following the similar format after 20 years. I not, don't take it as a negative sign. Discourse are good, it's healthy. Uh, but with a slight tinge of regret, I would like to mention that uh, in the implementation part, possibly we are not as good as we are in the research part. In the, in the domain of research, we have got wealth of information and we have got many experts. We have subject matter experts available everywhere. But as regards to the implementation, 
I think we have lacked. This is my personal uh, observation. Cybersecurity is new. It's a new domain. It's quite. Uh, uh, I feel these are all for me. It's all jargon uh, that they are using, but it is a very, a very important domain. And I think as of now, Bangladesh is lagging way behind. I'll just give a little example. I'm involved with a company. I'm a chairman of the power division of that company, and um, I take care of the construction and running of power plants. And we are now generating over 1,200 megawatts of power and giving it the national grid. So I wanted to have a software installed for managing the huge inventory. This is on the lighter side. The owners were not willing to do that because they were apprehensive that information the information may be hacked and leaked and taken away uh, in some form. So the, the fear is quite uh, relevant and fear is very genuine. So as he was trying, Nahyan was trying to explain, we have to do a lot in this particular uh, domain, that is cybersecurity domain, especially the protection of the critical infrastructure. We need to highlight those, enlist those, prioritize those, give them a status, and then we have to have arrangements to protect those domains, be it banks or power plants or any other critical infrastructure. We have discussed a lot about US-China relationship, as I was mentioning. 20 years ago, we were also discussing the same thing. Today, we say that the flashpoint is Taiwan. It had been there before also. Um, Ishtiak mentioned about the, the how the current people in Taiwan think about uh, this one China policy. Our discourse may be free from such uh, hindrances, but it has to revolve around the country's position of one China policy. And that is quite clear in our context. So we should keep that in mind. And with that little bit of perception from my side, I would like to thank BISS for inviting me here. It's good to be back after 20 years. Pasha, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mkaz, for inviting me here. And I had a very good time, very interactive and very fruitful and beneficial for me personally. So thank you, audience. Allah Hafiz. Distinguished guests, we are going to begin our final session of the seminar. In this session, we will have three more presentations from these faculty members. Dr. Razia Sultana, Senior Research Fellow, will present on soft power diplomacy in the changing global scenario, challenges and way forward for Bangladesh. Mohammad Rafi Dabrar Mia, Research Officer, will present his paper on economic diplomacy of Bangladesh from basket case to middle income country. And finally, Dr. Sufia Khanum, Senior Research Fellow, will talk about climate diplomacy of Bangladesh, lessons from COP27, and way forward. The presentations will be followed by an open discussion session. This session will be chaired by Professor Dr. Imtiaj Ahmed, Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka. May I kindly request the chair of the session to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, thank uh, the chair of BSS, my young friend, and the same name, Imtiaz. Uh, and also let me uh, thank uh, the, the Director General, uh, Mayor General uh, Pasha Habibuddin. Um, I'm always happy to be back with BSS. I have seen the birth of BSS. I'm quite an old haggard by now. I, I've literally seen the birth of BSS. So I was. I was a student then, so my memory with BSS goes way back. I think it's 1978 or something like that, right? Okay, we have uh, three very young researchers, uh, very qualified researchers. So I will not speak now, I will speak uh, at the end. And since this is the last session, we can continue till midnight. So, you know, bear, bear with me, bear with me. Uh, but I guess there's a time uh, allotted to them, 10 to 15 minutes, if I understand. So hopefully uh, they will, but then we can uh, continue with the Q&A. So let me now uh, invite Dr. Razia Sultana, 
and her paper is Soft Power Diplomacy in the Changing Global Scenario, Challenges and Way Forward for Bangladesh. Razia, it's all yours. Respected DG sir, my dear learned uh, audience, and my dear colleagues, assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to all of you. First of all, before I begin, I would like to um, say that it's really a great pleasure uh, to talk in front of our teacher, that is our moderator, Professor Intias. So, uh, so always good to see uh, you sir here. And um, I know it's very hard for me to wake you up. Uh, honestly, uh, I'll be very brief. Start say to like talk about until midnight. Um, I swear that I'm not going to talk until that time. So the title of my paper is Soft for Diplomacy in the Changing Global Scenario, Challenges and Way Forward for Bangladesh. So in contemporary war, uh, politics, the importance of soft power is immense. Some pressing concerns such as Russia Ukraine war, COVID-19 and subsequent outcomes like food and oil crisis, high inflation rates and overall downturn of the economy bound to rethink the countries regardless of small or big about their diplomatic maneuvers. Interestingly, we have witnessed significant changes in the behavior of the countries like joining uh, the neutral states like Sweden and Finland in NATO, increasing the different budget of Germany and China-Taiwan crisis that we, have heard, uh, we already heard from our one of the colleagues raised the question of whether the countries go back to the policy of hard power instead of soft power while pursuing their foreign policy goals in the changing and challenging circumstances. Like other countries, soft power is an important instrument for Bangladesh in order to achieve its foreign policy goals. In the changing international political relations, Bangladesh has been trying to pursue its own version of soft power diplomacy at the regional and international levels. It is crucial to revisit uh, how has soft power diplomacy shaped Bangladesh's foreign policy in the fabric of current global politics. So my key argument is that countries like us, which have scared of like, Hard power capacity should opt for soft power resources. Having said that, to support my argument, I have raised three, uh, raised three basic questions. The first one is how has soft power diplomacy shaped Bangladesh's foreign policy? My second question is what are the key predicaments in pursuing soft power diplomacy? And the third one is how can Bangladesh promote soft power diplomacy? So before I dig into deep, I want to uh, define what is soft power called. Perhaps one of the prominent uh, definition, I mean, or uh, popular definition has given by Joseph Knight, who is the proponent of soft power diplomacy. Uh, he said that back in 90s, and also he repeated in 2008, that soft power is the ability to get what one wants through attraction rather than coercion or payment. And also it is viewed as some sort of national power that, uh, that is deliberately or purposely used by the actors in international relations to achieve strategic goals. As far as Bangladesh is concerned, Bangladesh's soft power diplomacy is very much tied up and reflected in the core dictum of Bang Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, that is friendship to all, malice towards none. That is, increasing hard power capacity is opposed to its foreign policy objective, which primarily focus on peace instead of engaging in any cross conflict with other uh, countries. So there is an ample difference between hard power and soft power because uh, they work as an opposite direction. And uh, soft power is basic, uh, hard power is basically the exercise of influence through a coercion. It's like, it's, uh, in international relations, it's called like carrot stick, and it relies on tactics like military force, payment, economic sanction. And also, soft power uses attraction and uh, persuasion to change the minds, and it works, in, uh, it, it, I mean, it has the power to influence the behavior. And it sources like from culture, government, political values, and uh, global alliance. Uh, I mean, very um, pronouncedly. Then, definitely, uh, soft power. While uh, we discuss about soft power and hard power, that raises the question of smart power nowadays. Because in international politics, power is an important factor in determining the position of a country. In the changing scenario, it is clearly visible that the big powers, apart from their soft power strength, tend to rely on blended power, which is the combination of soft power and hard power that is popularly known as smart power. Basically, it is a synthesis, I mean, a skillful combination of soft power and hard power strategies. 
So now at the point, I would like to raise some of the question that actors of which countries can influence their foreign policy most to soft power diplomacy. I mean, how can uh, soft power di diplomacy work uh, to enhance their images? Uh, the numbers of soft countries that are exercising soft power tools are pretty big. As you can see in the, uh, in the slide, the I uh, just show you the symbols of soft power tools of various countries. I'll be very brief in here. First of all, I would like to uh, start from uh, the Middle East countries like Qatar. They create a unique identity and makes a sphere of influence worldwide by nurturing soft power tools, namely sports, uh, that just finished day before yesterday. Qatar has been widely deemed a strong voice for the Muslim Ummah and has shown its solidarity for Palestine that we've seen in the, uh, I mean, uh, uh, greater framework, Qatar successfully branded its image by connecting the world with social media, that is Al Jazeera channel and tourism, traveling particularly by Qatar allies. So Turkey is another potential country being the gateway between Asia and Europe is always opting for peace and stability and has taken a number of soft power initiatives being a mediator to hold the ongoing russia ukraine war. Now, I want to uh, jump in on uh, North American countries that is, according to Global Soft Power Index Study 2022, the USA bounced back to the top position because of extensive vaccination diplomacy through the country, though the country is known widely for exercising hard power. And in Oceania, I mean, uh, I want to uh, focus on Australia. It has the ability to influence others. It's reinforced by a number of soft power approaches like education, research, innovation, and of course, multiculturalism. If we look back to Asia, we can see that the countries such as Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Thailand, and China are progressing well because of launching magical soft power initiatives, which cannot be seen in the West even. South Korea has successfully integrated and blended traditional and pop culture that we see in the, we have seen in the World Cup, those who followed Jungkook song and K-pop, they know very well that how this time South Korea has influenced through their song and music. Among South Asian countries, India has always successfully attracted foreign investors by promoting tourism, film, and music. So now the question is, what is the key instrument of soft power diplomacy in Bangladesh in the current context? Now, in the last decade or so, Development has been an important tool of soft power in Bangladesh. The government is planning to actively work on certain development targets, such as graduating from LDC by 2026 and attaining a zero poverty line by 2031 to become a developed country by 2041. Second one is ensuring growth by promoting science and technology is another key soft power tool for Bangladesh. The third one is I'd li like to highlight that national branding is related to a new idea, although for Bangladesh, uh, through tourism, culture, export, and immigration. Another one is like uh, peace, secularism, nationalism, democracy, gender equality, and women uh, empowerment. And the final is foreign policy and diplomacy. That these two go hand in hand because diplomacy is identified as an important tool to negotiate with the other countries in areas of trade, energy, maritime. That at the moment Bangladesh is currently focusing on. And last but not the least. For any country, culture is an important element to pursue a country's national interest. It is one kind of public diplomacy in which certain aspects of culture, uh, like language, religion, sports, films, drama, art, education, play an important role. Now, in this slide, I wanted to show that Bangladesh has already made significant achievement in increasing uh, like uh, the soft power uh, instrument. For instance, uh, peace is the cornerstone of Bangladesh's foreign policy at the moment, and countries strongly promote the slogan of humanity for the sake of world peace, sheltering 1.2 million Rohingyas who are persecuted in Myanmar is an attempt of that kind of, uh, uh, I mean, behavior of which Bangladesh receives praise from the international community. And also peacekeeping, you know, is, uh, Bangladeshi peacekeepers are well known worldwide, especially in the war prone countries. And uh, also Bangladesh is, uh, is on a good track to utilize uh, the vaccine properly, or, or uh, I mean, I'm talking about the health diplomacy. And till now, Bangladesh, one of the two top recipients of the vaccine under the COVAX facilities. And Bangladesh has made a distinct position in global climate negotiation even. And Bangladesh is able to make a world-class movie and direction and filmmakers are capable of producing world-class films based on the contemporary politics, culture, and society. So at the regional level to optimize its national interest, Bangladesh focuses on some soft 
power tools like engaging with various regional and sub-regional blocks for ensuring energy, and Bangladesh has gained some success in terms of maritime in 2014. Now, when we talk about the uh, like soft power tools, exercising soft power tools, uh, Bangladesh is not devoid of like facing challenges because in the 2020 Global Soft Power Index, Bangladesh ranked 57 out of 60 countries and its position is barely changed uh, in 2021-2022. It's not a good like position. So several challenges hindered the implementation of soft power diplomacy, like lack of effective public diplomacy, lack of coordination among the various ministries, challenges to make a conducive environment to make the tourists and the foreigners. The second one is like digital challenges because despite enhancing digitalization at a large scale, we lack uh, of digital knowledge about the people uh, at the, I mean, from the, at the broader scale uh, and it's still a barrier for advancing soft power strategy. Uh, also, it is a matter of fact that countries endowed with huge talents and significant portion of the people are youth. So unfortunately, the education sector at the moment, especially during, after the COVID, has faced adverse challenge due to the lack of this kind of digitalization in the remote areas. And also like war-related challenges, pandemic-related challenges, and development-related challenges all comes, all comes together due to economic recession, high inflation rate, and price of commodities that have adverse impacts on trade and investment. Now, how can we get rid of this kind and how can we promulgate the soft power tools in the years to come, especially in this changing global circumstance? It is, I believe, high time to strengthen our soft power tools. It should come first from our neighbors because uh, our foreign minister in the morning said that uh, it is high time to like make good relationship with our neighbors to uh, I mean expand our market. Uh, I want to give one example like in Bangladesh, India got access to more than 80 channels, whereas Bangladeshi channels are restricted in India. So Bangladesh needs to reach markets. Uh, I mean uh, by using soft power tools in the neighboring countries. My second point is multilateral cooperation. To reach the global market, Bangladesh should actively engage with the multilateral forum. And uh, for, uh, because Bangladesh needs to enhance the, its ne negotiation capacity uh, for greater engagement of the regional bloc. My third suggestion is we have done uh, like uh, a lot uh, in kind of, uh, I mean, uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, selling our brand like made in Bangladesh to retain our image of uh, worldwide, but I think we have to do a lot still. We need to go, uh, I mean, a long way. So we have, uh, like al already, we have done a lot in case of garments and textile sector, but we need to sell ourselves in terms of ICT, pharmacy, and other emerging areas. My, uh, uh, another point is digital Bangladesh, because it has been a roadmap as well as slogan for Bangladesh to fulfill its dream to be a developed country by 2041. So digital diplomacy can be an area at, uh, for the country uh, that should take care of the incorporation of a new, younger, enthusiastic cohort uh, is very much crucial to strengthen the software strategy of the country. My last one is like image building. Uh, people to people connectivity that which is very much known as people's uh, diplomacy to connect with the foreign publics. Um, uh, this, uh, I mean, Argentina and Bangladesh uh, can be, a, a, I mean, glaring example for that because although Bangladesh and Argentina are located miles away and culturally very little in common, but football seems bringing them closer. The outpouring Bangladeshi support for Maisie is so strong that Argentina. Argentine Foreign Minister Santiago already showed his interest to establish diplomatic ties and open embassy after 40 years. And in the morning, our Foreign Minister also emphasized on the public diplomacy uh, to promote trade and investment. And as a matter of fact, it, we are, I mean, it's uh, very much, uh, I mean, good news that already uh, Argentine uh, Foreign Minister expressed to expand trade and investment and they want to take steel migration from our country. So, uh, in conclusion, I would say that Bangladesh, uh, which doesn't have a strong hard power mechanism or cannot strengthen its hard power capacity at the wink, I mean, in the wink of an eye, soft power is an efficient approach while making effective foreign policy. Uh, since Bangladesh has certain development goals ahead, the country should promote its own version of soft power strategy with greater imp uh, importance at conceptual as well as operational levels because the concept of soft power diplomacy has been evolving over time, especially when we are facing uh, this kind of volatile situation. So 
I suppose without a well-designed policy or skillful leadership, nothing can be achieved in this unprecedented time. So I want to end by uttering a quote, uh, I mean, given by former US speaker, Newt, uh, who said that the real key is not how many animals do I kill, the real key is how many alliances I gain. Having said this, I would like to end, end here. Thank you so much for your kind patience. Thank you very much, Dr. Sultana, for finishing in 12 minutes. That's that's quite a record for a Bangladeshi. You know, normally we can continue for hours. Uh, the second speaker I have here in the list is Muhammad Rafiq Abrar Mia, and his uh, theme uh, paper's uh, topic is Economic Diplomacy of Bangladesh from Basket Case to Middle Income Country. Rafiq, it's all yours. Thank you, sir, for giving me the floor. Respected chair of the session, uh, respected chairman and director general of BISS, distinguished guests, good afternoon. So it's always challenging to be a speaker in the later sessions. Uh, so I will try to be brief. So from the very beginning, from its journey, from the very inception of this country, Bangladesh was a subject to skepticism and depicted as a poster child of Meldusia. People are barely positive about its uh, growth and development because of the economic growth of a country depends upon multiple variables and uh, Pakistan military strategically and quite successfully destroyed many of those. Uh, as you can see in the slide, that they have destroyed our line of communication, rail bridges and uh, ports and transportation system and many other things and uh, it contributed and it awarded our economy with a minus 13% GDP growth rate. In 1972, the national poverty rate was as high as 71%. Population was growing exponentially, and the trade was very barely minimum, and the literacy rate was significantly lower. So all these features, all these features let Bangladesh be labeled as a bottomless basket. It was considered as a malevolent test case for development. But within just five decades, Bangladesh has proven all assumptions wrong that I mentioned that it was, there was a skepticism about its growth and development. And now considered as a new Asian miracle, considered as a development model. You can see in the slide that how much progress Bangladesh has made over these decades. And already Bangladesh has graduated from lower middle lower income country to lower middle income country and at the verge of LDC graduation. So how Bangladesh evolved as a success case of development, as a mere test case of development? This is the cold question ponders at this juncture. So drivers of growth and development varies case to case. It is contextualized, it's different for different, different countries. In our case, it is to a larger extent, the economic diplomacy, though it is not the only factor, but is one of the larger one, I would argue. Our prudent economic diplomacy helped attracting FDI, ensuring official development assistance or commonly known as foreign aid and creating foreign market for exporting goods and services. So prior to going there, so let us have a look about our uh, development decades. There are five decades of development. What has happened? So sorry, I don't know what is happening. So the first decade we call the decade of reconstruction, then just in the post-war scenario between 71 to 80. So uh, in this decade, uh, the lower part of the decade, we have shifted towards the market-based system in the 90s. Despite some measures, GDP growth was still low, poverty was still existing, and our entire development budget was completely foreign independent. In the third decade, especially in the half of the third decade, that is from 1995, Bangladesh was started emerging quite significantly. It was first attracting uh, the FDI, and in 1995, the uh, export was three times than it was in 1991, and by the end of uh, 2000, and the, that is the third decade, it excelled further. So, and then in the fourth decade, there was a bit of political turmoil, GDP and GDP growth rate, as well as the foreign direct investment, slightly increased, but export increased quite significantly. Again, in the lower part of this decade, uh, the government after 2009 has 
adopted considerable amount of uh, policies that has excelled the growth in the final decade, we commonly known, known as decade of growth. In this decade, probably Bangladesh has become most successful. The consecutively three years, for consecutively three years, the GDP growth rate was more than 7%, and it was 7.86% in the fiscal year uh, 2017 and 18, and the extreme poverty rate was below 11% just before the pandemic. So, uh, what has made this thing happen? How Bangladesh became a, a test case of uh, a development model from a development what drove the growth and development of Bangladesh to the larger, to such a miraculous state? So one of those is the foreign direct investment. And in a countries like Bangladesh, it has been proven that uh, foreign direct investment contributes in reducing poverty, meeting the socioeconomic goals, and some sort of uh, employment, generation of employment and reduction of unemployment. So, Apart from that, official development assistance or aid, foreign aid to a multi-dimensional sectors have also contributed in the growth of this country. And it helped between 2006 and 2018, study shows that it aided Bangladesh's de economy developing quite sustainably. Apart from these two, uh, our duty-free quota fee facility, our uh, preferential rules of origin commonly known as ROO, and then the foreign trade specific economic uh, diplomacy also contributed growing Bangladesh to a larger extent. Apart from that, uh, adoption of investor friendly policies and then establishment of more near about 100 economic zones, along with some special economic zones, fostering electricity generation, then energy diversification and developing the communication system. All these things also contributed our economy to grow further. And now, I mean, the FDI, the ODA, the major drivers of our development, the market access to the foreign countries, nothing could be possible without our prudent economic diplomacy. That to deal with the Bangladesh's foreign trade specific economic diplomacy, government of Bangladesh exercises several instruments, including finalizing and updating legal binding contracts, strengthening um, the role of foreign missions in Bangladesh, and then national branding, exercising consular diplomacy, exercising commercial diplomacy, and marketing brand Bangladesh with this product image, liberalizing the trade regimes, that is restructuring the tariff structures, increasing efficiency of trade negotiators, and also, and quite exclusively, engaging Bangladeshi diaspora in prospective different countries or regions, in fact, to uh, enhance Bangladesh's international trade. So all these things, basically, uh, contributed so far to develop Bangladesh's economy in country and beyond. But what is there? Some challenges are ahead. Uh, as in the morning session, we have seen that Bangladesh export basket needs to be revised because uh, my just previous speaker has said, and I also uttered, uh, that uh, Bangladesh is going to be graduated uh, to the developing country category from LDC in 2026. And it has um, it, it has, uh, along with some good news, it has some implications to our economy as well. And it was seen that so far the growth and of uh, our uh, export market was competitive pricing and larger volume and uh, was mostly dependent on the, our pricing. So our pricing was quite lower and that contributed accessing the market quite uh, literally and but after 2026, our international support missiles, the tariffs and trade facilities that we are we so far have enjoyed is going to be reduced. And once it will reduce, it is assumed that almost $4 billion per year will be the trade loss. This says that to date, considerable number of economies, especially developing countries, failed accelerating their pre-graduation growth after once they graduate from LDC category to developing category. As a result, their growth momentum got stuck and they trapped in the middle income trap commonly known as MIT. So since our duty-free quota free facility will be um, eroded, our preferential rules of origin will be um, eroded, and then our uh, most of the regional arrangement like SAFTA will not be ending those free trade agreements that is going to uh, bring a considerable number of 
challenges. Apart from that, we also know Bangladesh already have graduated from lower income to lower middle income country, and that labels Bangladesh as a non blend country. So as a non blend country, so far, as I have said, that official development assistance was there, and under that uh, system, Bangladesh was awarded with concessional and non-concessional loans. But once a country is a non blend country, that is entitled only for non-concessional loans, and with non-concessional non-concessional loans comes with more stringent settings, more uh, tougher terms. And so far, Bangladesh's external sector debt and debt service payment was quite impressive and magnificent. But we assume that after graduation, situation might be a bit stringent. So, what next? What we can do? So, amidst the situation, adoption of strategies should include various policy options at the national level and improvements at the farm level. I mean, the, my point of argument is only policy adoption from the national level or only changes or improvement in the farm level will not do. There needs a uh, coordination in both operational and policy level side. It's worth mentioning that focusing on single industry for exporting is not good for the market or market will not be sustainable in the longer run. So, and it is in fact, I would argue that it's in fact a potential threat to the sustainability of any economy. Uh, so the coping studies in the trade related aspect, particularly for Bangladesh should focus on price learning issues. That is um, bilateral trade negotiation uh, to the potential importers. I mean, our export destinations and then the reducing the production cost and and that's um, a bit challenging in their argues, but I would argue that uh, our techno in, uh, interventions or more or less technology transfer can contribute to a larger extent in this regard. And also the state of local governments for uh, make our policies or the environment more investor friendly. But these three points are not the only one. Uh, these are some of the points I would argue. Among those three, the bilateral trade negotiation and agreement, I think the pivotal most and in the bilateral uh, FTAs without the bilateral FTAs, Bangladesh will, um, and it will be hard for Bangladesh to continue its growth because if after the graduation, there will be, I mean, considerable amount of loss. And if this loss occurs, our main major destinations like European Union, Japan, Australia, Canada, USA, India, China, the, in these countries, our um, uh, product export will considerably be uh, restricted. And Apart from RNG, we should look for some expo export diversifications like um, in European Union, Japan, Australia, and Canada. Apart from RNG, we are also good at home textile and foodwares. In India and China, vegetable textile fiber is, has also an existing market. So in these products, uh, we should uh, focus more and we, our, our diplomatic intervention should focus more on these issues further. Apart from these products, Bangladesh also uh, should, I believe, um, focus on pharmaceutical products, frozen fish, and agro products. My previous speaker was talking about soft power, hard power, and small power. So the practicing economic diplomacy, in fact, aggressive economic diplomacy with effective bargaining power, whether it is soft or it is hard or it is smart, should be installed. Why I'm saying this? Because it, with the word aggressive diplomacy, I would argue that it should not restricted only within market searching. Apart from market searching, we should come up with the policies and interventions that will help us entering those markets. So with, the, uh, with our effective bargaining power of any type, we should practice aggressive economic diplomacy and it should be contextualized because the products we are exporting in India may not be similar for Japan. So in every country, what are our existing market is, what are our strengths are? Considering all those things, Bangladesh should focus there, customize the method of diplomacy and para diplomacy in economic aspect in particular may also be very effective in this regard, I think. And most importantly, any economic arrangement uh, engaging in any economic arrangement should be assessed with um, quite significantly uh, for our further growth and development of economy. So if all these things uh, can be ensured, and um, as PricewaterhouseCoopers says that by the 2030, Bangladesh will be the 28th largest economy of the country, I argue that if these things can be ensured, Bangladesh is going to be one of the 
leading and promising countries and maybe we will be able to avoid being trapped in the middle income trap as i mentioned with this note uh, i would like to conclude thank you all very much thank you uh, rafid uh, you managed it in 14 minutes that's also i believe a uh, good work we have the final speaker dr sofia khanum and her topic is climate diplomacy of bangladesh lessons from cop27 and way forward sofia it's all yours Respected Chair uh, of DISS and uh, DG Sir, Respected Chair of the session, Professor um, Dr. Indir Hamid Sir, uh, distinguished audience, my dear fellow colleagues, and to this paper presenters, Assalamu Alaikum and a very good afternoon. The title of my presentation is Climate Diplomacy of Bangladesh Lessons uh, from COP27 and Way Forward. So, these are the very um, rough sections of my presentation. Uh, first, I would like to focus on what is climate diplomacy. Although there is not uh, very much a structured definition of the climate diplomacy, but I would like to uh, structure it um, by using various uh, the international organization, those who are practicing the climate diplomacy uh, in the in climate regime, uh, in, the, in, the, in the diplomatic arena. And Bangladesh's climate diplomacy, and uh, major outcomes of COP27 and uh, what is the expectation and uh, the reality um, uh, during the COP summits and the way forward for Bangladesh. Um, I, I, I try to um, give some of the policy suggestions in this section uh, for the um, uh, climate diplomacy for the future uh, negotiations. So in um, climate diplomacy, I would like to focus on the definition, major pillars, uh, narratives, and uh, negotiation blocks, and what are the politics, priorities, and the practices uh, in these um, uh, diplomatic initiatives and the negotiations. So according to the uh, European Commission, uh, defines the four strands of um, the climate diplomacy at the political level. First, it's committing to multilateralism in climate policy, particularly to the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Second, um, one is um, addressing the implication of climate change on peace and security, and accelerating uh, domestic action and raising a global ambition. And a fourth one, the enhancing international climate cooperation through advocacy and outreach. In this sense, climate diplomacy encompasses the use of diplomatic tools to support the ambition and functioning of the international climate change regime and to attenuate the negative impacts climate change risk calls for peace, stability, and prosperity. Climate diplomacy calls for preparing appropriate, uh, appropriate risk assessment and risk management strategies at the global and strategic level. So climate diplomacy also means prioritizing the climate action with partners worldwide in diplomatic dialogue public diplomacy and external policy instruments. So this includes reaching out to partner countries bilaterally and making the case for more ambitious climate actions. So by taking cross-cutting issues into account, climate diplomacy addresses the security and stability, implications of climate change, entry actions or early actions on the security risk of climate change requires a strong network of partners, and including representatives from the civil society, private sectors, international, environmental, and climate uh, diplomacy, bilateral environmental cooperation, as well as environmental policy can promote dialogue and confidence building, thereby contributing to regional st stability as well. So with this, if we see the evolution of position and the country groupings in the climate change negotiation, you will see that before 2001, there are uh, just two uh, different groups. One is uh, developed countries and the developing countries, which was basically based on the uh, idea of climate justice. And then in 2001 to 2009, there was a shift. There is a splintering um, uh, of developed and developing countries. And then like European Union, USA, and Australia, Rest of the umbrella group, Russia, Environmental Integrity Group, uh, which uh, contains like Switzerland, Korea, and Mexico, and then Central Group, 
जी ग्रुप सेवेंटी सेवन प्लस चाइना ओपेक आफ्रिका ग्रुप लैटिन अमेरिका प्लस कैरिबियन ग्रुप स्मॉल स्मॉल आईलैंड ग्रुप सेंट्रल एशिया एशिया एंड कैकम ग्रुप सो फर्दर इन टू थाउजेंड नाइन एंड बियॉन्ड द ग्रुप हेज बीन फर्दर डिवाइडेड इन टू अदर स्मॉल ग्रुप एंड देन अगेन बेसिक आईला कंट्रीज एंड लाइक माइंडेड ग्रुप एल्बा एल डी सी एंड सम ऑफ द अदर ग्रुप एक्चुअली फॉर्मुलेटेड सो ओवर द इयर्स एक्चुअली द क्लाइमेट नेगोसिएशन इज गेटिंग मोर कॉम्प्लेक्स एंड कॉम्प्लेक्स so if you see the major climate negotiation block you will see that um, and i i i know that you already know that one single country cannot participate in the climate negotiation um, discussion so they must have to form a group or coalition so if you see this uh, picture you will understand the how complex the climate negotiation or the climate diplomacy is and uh, bangladesh is actually within the ldc group and also in the group 77 and plus china group so whatever is going on this um, issues or the diplomatic action is actually very much connected with the ldc group and the group 77 and uh, plus china group so uh, if i uh, categorize the uh, climate diplomacy and its politics behind and the practices and the priorities so first i would like to start with the justice issue like the from the very beginning like before 2000 uh, before uh, from the early stages of the climate dip- concept of climate diplomacy which was based on the north south divide it was assumed that the not that the activities or the industrialization activities of the developed countries the southern part of the globe is suffering from the impact of the climate change and there is also a political economy exist because um, uh, within the developed and the developing countries because the developed countries already has many more resources and they are strategically far more developed than the developing countries so there is a political economy within this uh, uh, diplomatic initiatives and then again the coalition formation it is also affecting and um, the coalition formation the country which is more politically powerful they are more advanced is your position to form the coalition and we need to focus on the reduce the complexity and improve the bargaining power like those who are politically less powerful in the global politics where actually the developing countries are far behind from the developed countries and there is also the fragmented leadership in the climate diplomacy the leaders are divided the national priority national interest are prioritized in the diplomatic uh, initiatives and then the, there is emerging leadership uh, earlier in the countries the eu uh, european union the usa and the other countries are in the uh, at the position of the they are playing the leadership role but now the basic countries and the like small groups like uh, small island groups they are also uh, evolve as a um, emerging leader in the climate diplomacy field and there is also lack of consistency some new uh, points and new issues are coming like in the earlier stages their adaptation the mitigation was the main agenda then uh, it comes um, adaptation now people are focusing on the loss and damage so uh, lack of consistency is also um, one of the major area of concern where actually diplomatic uh, initiatives or the priorities are uh, not uh, taken into the seriously and uh, then again uh, there are some other points that um, sometimes some small players like um, as i mentioned that the small island group which is actually play a big role in the uh, in the climate diplomacy because of their um, orientation and the presentation of their sufferings in the climate negotiation or the impact of the climate change and they can showcase their sufferings and their vulnerabilities in the world forum that how the climate change is actually affecting those small countries small island countries and there is also a greater debate about the science and the politics the, uh, the scientist group thinks that the science should uh, actually lead the climate diplomacy but the politician thinks that the this is the uh, issue of politics so there is a clear conflict about the science and the politics like the politicians do not believe on the scientist and the scientists don't think that politician understand the scientific evidence so that is the debate and there is the negotiation for what because if we see the statistics we see that most of the time the negotiation which is very much uh, 
uh, which has a very market value, like which is very much connected with the business and the private organization. This actually, this agreement or this treaty actually got the successful ending. But those which are very much connected with the environmental issues or for the betterment of the environment, that issues actually don't get uh, much of the priority in the negotiation table. So sometimes it is uh, very much questionable that why we are doing the climate diplomacy? Is it for the environment or is it for the economic uh, benefit? And then again, then again, the role of UNFCC. Although UNFCC is giving a huge platform for the develop and the developing countries to negotiate, to discuss, and to uh, to um, uh, get some of the consensus, but actually the gradual increase of the events, subsessions, and controversy, and the procedural dispute, and the transparency in the whole proce procedure, actually making the climate diplomacy more complex. And then again, the role of non-state actors. Although there is a very uh, much influence of the non-state actors, but uh, their absence in the main uh, meeting room or in the main negotiation room actually uh, make them invisible in the in the negotiation, real negotiation process. So, if we just uh, focus on the um, um, on the climate uh, context, climate change context, and what we have achieved in the COP27, although the achievement is not very much connected with the national achievement as we negotiate in a group. So rather, I should say it is a uh, achievement of a group uh, which Bangladesh actually uh, part of. Uh, so if I uh, uh, go one by one. So Bangladesh, we all know that Bangladesh is already identified as one of the most vulnerable countries. And the global risk index shows its position is seven um, um, uh, due to the climate um, uh, risk assessment. And uh, due to this climate Im change uh, impacts, we lost about two to 9% of our GDP every year. And uh, a net increase of poverty by 15% by 2030 due to this negative impact of the climate change. And about 1.3 million people will become climate migrant due to this adverse impacts. And we need $230 billion by 2050 to increase the, its adaptation capacity. So as a developing country like Bangladesh, this is, amount is huge. And in COP27, Bangladesh wins the locally led adaptation champion award for its one of the projects in um, uh, Chitong Hill Trust. So this is the only achievement as a country. And um, there are um, some other issues uh, I will discuss in the later part of my presentation. So if you see this, uh, uh, this uh, map, uh, this figure, you will see that uh, Bangladesh is uh, is connected with another uh, diplomatic uh, forum, although it is not very much um, a formal group in the uh, in the diplomatic arena. But um, uh, um, the CVF, like Climate Vulnerable Forum, which is actually in the para negotiation block and which is trying to influence the formal negotiation group, like Umbrella Group, ILAC, and um, uh, least developing countries, and through this CVF platform, Bangladesh is also trying to connect with another um, climate uh, negotiation group, quite a strong negotiation group like Africa group. So uh, I think um, uh, this uh, platform, Bangladesh has already uh, led this um, uh, uh, forum for two times and uh, which Bangladesh is also very much uh, actively engaged in this uh, in this platform and through this platform, Bangladesh is actually um, going to focus its all achievements and uh, and it's uh, actually trying to influence the uh, global uh, diplomatic negotiation through its various uh, various um, activities and the experts are also um, get focused uh, uh, through this platform. And if I uh, focus on the major outcomes of COP27, so uh, in terms of I have divided this uh, whole uh, outcome because it's a huge uh, conference, so summit. So I I tried to summarize it. Uh, uh, if you have any confusion, uh, so you can ask me in the open discussion session. So regarding the climate mitigation, there are about uh, there there was a target that 43 percent will be mitigated by 2000 to uh, 2030. 
and uh, there is a climate adaptation although there is a huge adaptation gap and um, uh, in the commitment and uh, the actual um, uh, uh, actual fund disbursement and due to regarding climate finance the developed countries actually promised that 100 billion dollar will be um, uh, will be paid for uh, uh, for uh, this uh, climate uh, adaptation and uh, for the for proper um, for the adaptation uh, practices of the developing countries and the new issues which is very much um, uh, important for the least developing countries and for the climate vulnerable country which is loss and damage and but unfortunately there is no uh, ambitious plan to stop the fossil fuel and there is a vogue uh, 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 verbal city uh, emphasis uh, which this is only focusing on the early warning system and um, there is no clear cut actually planning for reduce the adaptation gap. And there is also unclear on dealing with the uh, surging climate bill, which uh, is $100 billion already the developed countries has proposed. And there is a, although there is a proposal on establishment of a dedicated fund for the loss and damage, but still it is in the planning phase. Uh, so there is no concrete uh, decision in this aspect. So um, if I uh, say some more words on the COP27, I must say that uh, there is a um, uh, uh, there is a conference of the parties serving as the com committing of the parties to the Paris Agreement. In short, it is called CMA. So CMA3 established and launched a comprehensive two year, like 2022 to 2023, like Glasgow and Sharm al-Sheikh, work program and global goal on adaptation and decide to review the framework prior to the second global stock uh, global uh, stock take which was first global uh, stock take was undertaken in 2021 so after 5 years um, um, uh, and bangladesh has already um, and there are some planning to national adaptation plan bangladesh has already uh, prepared the national adaptation plan already 40 country has prepared that uh, national adaptation plan but unfortunately, mostly the developing countries has prepared the national adaptation plan rather than the developed or the other countries. And there is a recent uh, place that um, uh, regarding the long term financing, um, which is actually connected with the adaptation fund totaling to 211 um, uh, million dollar and least developing countries fund like 70.6 million dollar and a special climate change fund, which is 35 uh, million dollar which is actually there is no commitment regarding this and then again uh, the new uh, collective quantifiable goals this uh, the eighth replen uh, replenishment of um, uh, uh, global um, uh, 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 global environmental fund totaling which is totaling uh, 5.3 billion and with a climate related finance target of no less than 80 percent of funding com commitment and this is uh, all this uh, common fund actually recognize the lack of a common definition and accounting the methodology and then again um, uh, the loss and damage which is based on the santiago um, network uh, and in cop 21 it was de decided that in accordance with article 9 and para article 9 and para 3 of this article of paris agreement developed countries intend to continue their existing collective mobilization now goal to 2025 and there are several high level ministerial dialogues and establishment of an uh, ad hoc work program in 2022 but uh, in 2024 but it is all all of these discussion are actually uh, fixed into this just meeting and dialogue there is no actually uh, concrete uh, decision and, uh, and finish it in two minutes i'll try so. thank you so and uh, there is a transnational committee uh, and there is a there is a transnational committee to manage this um, uh, uh, loss and damage fund and uh, there is a, a decision that the committee will prepare a report that how can loss and damage be implemented and uh, how uh, the concrete uh, uh, way of disbursing the fund for the developing countries and then again uh, there is a four mandate uh, which will be operationalized uh, which is still in the planning phase to um, uh, operationalize this uh, loss and damage mechanism but uh, uh, still there are some questions actually remain that how uh, to remarkably reduce this greenhouse gas and fossil fuel dependency 
and uh, regarding loss and damage, how much money would be raised and who will contribute, who will be the beneficiaries, who will manage the fund and what will be the criteria uh, to trigger a payout and how to involve the financial institutions in the mainstream climate change action and how to move from the planning and discussion phase to the implementation phase and what will the COP28 achieve when it is hosted by a major fossil fuel exporter. So if you see the graph um, uh, in, the, in the left side, most of the uh, fossil fuel lobbyists actually um, uh, presented in the COP27. So in, in COP28, where, where uh, actually UAE will hosted this, um, uh, this uh, COP summit and uh, how far the fossil fuel lobbyists can do for their own benefit in the next uh, climate diplomacy uh, or the uh, COP summit. So with this, I have some uh, policy recommendation for regarding the um, uh, climate diplomacy of Bangladesh. So uh, Bangladesh uh, need to do the branding of Bangladesh through the climate diplomacy because we have a lot of experts. We have a lot of good initiatives which needs to be showcased like the, uh, the other countries, those who are actually um, uh, marketing uh, uh, are using for their own marketing and can support the other vulnerable nations through global um, center on adaptation. So we can actually support the other vulnerable countries, especially the African countries, although we have some uh, already some of the uh, framework where we can actually negotiate and we can actually exchange our knowledge and invest in developing a national mechanism to tackle the loss and damage. Still, we don't have this type of mechanism. And then again, we need a balanced representation of the negotiation team and capacities. We don't select the negotiators according to the uh, uh, according to the capacities and according to the uh, skill that we need and engage the private sectors and the youth as the private sector get priorities in the climate change negotiation and there are a lot of opportunities for the green uh, investment. So why don't we engage some of the private sectors and youth in this group um, in terms of long-term negotiation and no compromise in selecting the country's best skilled and most talented negotiators. And with this, I would like to end my presentation with a quote. Um, uh, uh, no, we cannot compromise with the earth. We cannot compromise with the catastrophe of unchecked climate change. So we must compromise with one another. So as a part of diplomacy is open, different definition of self-interest. So we need to identify our own interest for our country. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for bearing with Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sophia Khanum. Okay, let's uh, open the floor. Questions, comments, uh, if you can be brief, uh, then can we can wind up also very quickly and not take you to the midnight. Ishwak Bhai, go ahead. First, one of the things that we have to do that in this is that <clears throat> improving the technology level of our manpower that we export. You see, the Bangladesh image in the Middle East country has been one of the cleaners and sensational uh, municipal workers. If we could upgrade in our country people, you know, skilled manpower, drivers, you know, train operators, air conditioned mechanics, things like that. So, Okane Amadev education, we have to give more emphasis in our education system and also. You know, um, um, we have to uh, prepare our people to accept this thing as a as a challenge. And about the <coughs> about garments also, there is a need for to go into the high end products. We are already only on the lower side of the year. high end. Yeah, the onic future are seven. I think people are already moving about this uh, about uh, your challenges. I think Bangladesh is in the place in future is a. Um, Elderly people, you see, people like us will be <laughs> way into our 70s. And he was too young, yeah. Uh, no. so <laughs> you see, with our driving, falling birth rate and increasing the, yeah, which is good sign, our life expectancy, life expectancy is going, but ask it again, is what for it? You are, if you have to decide, are you are rich and old or poor and old. If you are poor and old, you know, you had it. So nationwide, I want to get it in the. This is a big challenge that's coming up in future. Thank you. Uh, anyone at the back? Uh, any young mind? Or 
and old person with young mind that will also do. No? Okay. Lovely. Uh, oh, yes, please, Mahfuz, go ahead. Sorry. Thank you, sir. Uh, just a few, uh, in fact, compliments with, with my colleagues who presented the, their papers. So it's regarding, first regarding the ODA. So I think there is a big challenge ahead, ahead of us. So just because of, before the COVID-19 and the onset of COVID-19, so the, we are receiving around 6 billion US dollars uh, per year. And then we uh, need an additional funding of 3 billion uh, just, uh, with respect to the, in fact, additional fund requirement that was calculated by the Planning Commission back in 2017. So we are receiving that money. So altogether 9 billion US dollars. But still, so we, we have the challenges and, and there, there is a, in fact, we don't know I mean, the hope, when the things will be normal and we'll be getting the money in order to achieve the SDGs. So that is a challenge. And LDC graduation. So we are conducting a study on the LDC, the possible, uh, in fact, repercussion on the economy and what would be the way out. So they, they will, be, in fact, presenting the paper in, in, in the coming uh, programs. And and regarding the FTA, so it's not that easy. So um, even though the discussion on, on the FTA with India started back in 2006, and uh, the government was ready, and also the World Bank was supporting with the technical studies. But you see, I mean, now we are discussing about SEPA and studies. Uh, Conducted, but still, I mean, that there is an uncertainty, and we are also hopeful regarding the FTA with the other regional countries like China, Malaysia, and, and other in fact, regional countries. But still, there is an uncertainty, and finally, we are thinking of, of uh, FTA with the EU because there is a discussion that I mean, the Vietnam has an FTA with, with the EU, and they are getting many benefits. But and as of now, I mean, the EU is not interested to do any any further FTA, and that also includes Bangladesh. So. And Bangladesh is now uh, trying to, in fact, do an, 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 a sign a bilateral in fact, investment treaty with the uh, EU. So that will facilitate a lot uh, in terms of our uh, export to uh, in, in the EU countries. So that is the thing, and the and very interesting thing that was uh, mentioned by the by the last speaker, Dr. Sufia. So there is an interesting aspect of the climate change market. So now, in on, one side, I mean, the, if you consider the case of China, the biggest emitter, but they also produce the the RE technology, the biggest uh, amount of RE technology, and they are also the highest producers of, of the renewable energy. So that is a uh, kind of, in fact, uh, dichotomy. And there is another country called Russia. So they are neither in the side of the scientists who are, in fact, uh, providing the, the issue of climate change, and also with, with the emitters. So there are, in fact, a lot of differences in the, in the opinions and in the, in, the, in the political side. And the final thing is the adaptation gap. So where our requirement is $100 billion, but if we see the report of the adaptation gap of 2020, so now only $28.7 billion. So what is the uh, next? So is there any clear commitment uh, of, of the global community to, to in fact, compensate the, the, in fact, these developed countries? So there's nothing, in fact, to, that we can see, and now we are facing the, in the problems of, of the global, in fact, uh, slowdown. And final issue is the UAE. So there are two things. I mean, there, there is a huge lobby uh, from the from the in fact the fossil uh, fuel in fact producers, and and also there is an institution called Irina. So this is also located in the UAE. So we'll be seeing the interesting things in the in the next COP. So with this, I would like to thank. Thank you. Oh, we have a burning question. Okay, please. Thank you. No question, rather a comment. Uh, this is Alauddin. I was a member of. BERC uh, about the presentation from Dr. Sufia Khanam. Uh, not to speak of honoring or rightly valuing the climate experts of our country who are, uh, if we can say, in, of international level. We don't even, we hesitate to recognize them even. And uh, maybe the reason is uh, hegemony, if I can say, hegemony of bureaucracy over meritocracy. Whatever be the reason, we have to come out of this mindset. I think. Thank you very much. Please. Thank you. Oh, so we have another burning question. Please. Thank you, sir. Uh, there are many littoral countries who might be affected by the climate change, and it is very natural because it is coming naturally, and every country is looking for fund from the uh, fund being created in the climate resilience fund. But the amount of funds so far gathered is very scanty in relation to the amount needed. As we understand, only Bangladesh could be needing 100 billion. 
Shall we really wait for that up to COP27 and another COP27 COPs will be coming and probably this fund will never come. Thank you. Uh, good. I think we had enough questions. Let's do it in a reverse way. Uh, so, you, uh, Sophia, you go first. Uh, one minute. Yes. Thank you. Um, th no. Thank you, um, sir, for giving me the floor again. So uh, for my uh, first uh, comments regarding uh, Dr. Mahfuz was, um, yes, COP28 will be the um, summit for the fossil fuel lobbyists. We can understand easily, as I showed in my presentation, that in the COP27, the fossil fuel lobbyists are the majority among all the lobbyists. So when it will be in UAE, definitely they, they are lobbyists. So, uh, uh, it is unfortunate for the developing countries or the climate vulnerable countries like us, but it's the global reality. We can't actually change whatever we can say outside the uh, venue. And uh, yes, I'm very much agree with um, Saladin sir. We hesitate to recognize so that I mentioned in my last bullet point that we need to actually identify those who are actually do the proper negotiation for the country not to you know just shopping and be a part of the tourist so um, i i must not hesitate to say that um, uh, in the cop 27 actually those who need to negotiate in the negotiation table so from the bangladesh part we we are not very much connected with the pakistan in the in the other diplomatic forum but in the climate negotiation forum we closely worked with the uh, Pakistan group. So which is actually positive, like climate is such a, in, uh, like a factor or the, uh, which actually, uh, you know, help us to work together. And unfortunately, we really don't recognize our merit. We have very much uh, good expertise on this sector and we have a very good expert and knowledge on this sector, especially the locally led adaptation sector but we really don't recognize them and they really don't get the badge to enter into the main negotiation, you know, the uh, auditorium and of course the literal countries and some of the, all the literal countries are not the less powerful in the, in the negotiation table because of showcasing their vulnerability in the global arena, like the uh, association of the small island countries. They are the most powerful group in the climate negotiation they are small in the size, but, uh, you know, because of their presentation, like Maldives, they showcase in such a way in the negotiation or in the diplomatic arena. So they can actually, uh, they are, they are, uh, um, uh, how can I say, their influence is much more significant than the other countries. So with this said, thank you. I think I have covered all the comments. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say uh, shopping is a good therapy, actually. So... You know, <laughs> you know, you, one should not, uh, you know, blame shopping. And if you're traumatized, you should go for shopping. It's a, it's a good therapy. Um, yes, Rafid, one minute for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for giving me the floor again. Uh, to the question of uh, Ishfaq, sir, sir, yes. Nah, I have no way to disagree with the point you have mentioned about the elderly people. And I think, I mean, we should come up with some exclusive alternatives that maybe we are yet to see it to be implemented about the european union and other ftas uh, sir yes uh, ftas are quite i mean it seems difficult but uh, we don't have any other choice other than pursuing for it but it, because if we do not go for it there will be challenge and you have rightly mentioned the climate is an issue i mean we are not living in the kuznet era i mean uh, what the Kuznet has said that uh, pollution should be or the climate should be neglected and then the economy should be promoted, but we cannot afford it uh, given our current global scenario. So climate, uh, green economic policy as uh, uh, in the, this is the new term, new jargon is coming that the green economic policy is basically good for economy itself. So we can, Bangladesh may look into that fact and uh, this is a the, the study based on what I have presented to you. It's a published one. You can, uh, for, if any you would like, you can find it in the journal on Malaysian Global Affairs. It is uh, 
published there and I will not do the justice if I do not mention that it is co-authored by two of my research directors, Dr. Marcus Kovic sir and Dr. Joshin sir, and uh, you can find in the website, it's available there. With that note, I'd like to thank. Thank you, Razia. Thank you, sir, again. And uh, one question directed to me, uh, Ishwak sir. Uh, actually, this is basically a comment uh, from his side, but I want to add a few points like, um, I want to highlight a quote of Morgan who is a realist. He said that power is everything because man by nature is a political animal. So if we want to, I mean, uh, make a position in international area, there's no alternative of power. So, uh, uh, sir, you have correctly mentioned that um, we are technology lagged behind and we have a shortage of skilled manpower across the world, especially if we look back to the Middle East countries, Saudi Arabia is our main source of like a manpower destination, but unfortunately, we usually, we tend to actually uh, send uh, the, our unskilled manpower. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, uh, in the years to come, it will be a real challenge to uh, grab this market because in 2030, Saudi Arabia has a vision, like 2031 vision, and they're looking for fourth generation, uh, fourth, uh, 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 I mean, they're coping with the, uh, trying to cope with the fourth revelation. So I think, uh, in, uh, I mean, in future, we cannot, uh, Hope or, or to keep pace with this world, we have to uh, keep ourselves upgraded. And we have to look back the unskilled uh, cohort because this is a very big chunk. And if we want to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, improve our image worldwide, definitely uh, we have to improve ourselves from, from the home. So I, 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 I will emphasize on the vocational training of them side by side. We have to emphasize on the Skill manpower already. Uh, I appreciate government because already government has, especially during the COVID-19, has, uh, 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 I mean, incorporated some of the scholarships, especially you all know that Bongo Bundu scholarship. Uh, I have seen that so many, uh, I mean, um, students are going there because of the COVID-19, the scholarship, uh, um, scholarship opportunities are squeezed. So uh, to retain this Bangladesh government, uh, trying to focus on the research and education. I, I think uh, it, we should continue this. Another point you said that uh, correctly, that uh, in government sector, uh, we have like, uh, we cannot go at the managerial post most of the time, Sri Lanka, India, they have occupied this, uh, I mean, powerful force. So without improving ourselves, perhaps we couldn't, um, uh, I mean, uh, reach at that point. So it is high time to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, improve ourselves and um, change ourselves uh, and uh, especially uh, we talk about the digital market we talk about the, uh, the uh, i mean uh, 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 um, uh, digital bangladesh but uh, in reality we have seen that during the covid 19 so many dropouts especially in the rural areas because we are very much confined in terms of uh, technology where uh, i mean it's very li limited within the city areas but in the rural areas uh, we cannot uh, reach them at all. So we have, um, um, I think it's, it is the perfect time uh, to focus on that particular area. And also you are right, sir, uh, after 20 years, we are facing the problem of elderly people like Japan is currently facing. And uh, although Japan is very much uh, uh, technologically, uh, I mean, high peak country, but uh, unfortunately they are facing only sufferings. And I've seen a video that uh, the, the old people are, you know, uh, uh, living alone, even before dying, their dead bodies are like inside the room. And nobody is, uh, I mean, uh, uh, trying to even pick them after three, four uh, days. And the security forces then uh, broke out the doors and then they uh, pick up the dead bodies. So I think everything has a pass and call. So we should uh, uh, take care of uh, things as well. And lastly, but not the least, because uh, I, my key focus is to improvise our soft power tools, uh, considering the current context, uh, I would request, and I have a personal suggestion that perhaps this is the high time for MOFA to open some kind of soft power wings uh, that we have seen in India and other small countries as well. So uh, if we want to promulgate all kinds of like resources and uh, like um, uh, incorporate all sorts of our talent and strength, I think uh, we should work on this uh, separately. Having said that, thank you so much. And thank you so much for your kind patient, I mean, kind, uh, patience uh, to sit here and hear us thank you so much thank you uh, well let me thank all the all the speakers i think uh, uh, they have their uh, positions now as a moderator you know you need to say something otherwise you know the organizer would say it's a waste of time why a fellow was invited to begin with so i will not continue till midnight 
though I have a habit of talking for hours, uh, my longest uh, soliloquy was uh, three hours uh, without, uh, you know, dots and uh, commas. So, but I will not do that today. I'll, I'll, I'll limit myself. The first one that I want to highlight, and since this is a colloquium, and I'm trying to take the advantage of the colloquium, it's a colloquium. So I believe those who have spoken uh, are looked after as students, and there will be seniors who would be listening to them and, and get a sense of where their respective papers are going and where Bangladesh is going. The first thing that I think we need to, and I say to all the researchers, I've heard the last uh, previous the three speakers and also three, so six I've heard. So I'm making, I've not heard in the morning, so I have no idea how they spoke, uh, but let me uh, highlight some of the things. One thing I think uh, the young researchers uh, should concentrate is on the word Bangladesh when it comes to BISS. That Bangladesh is missing when it comes to epistemology. The sources of knowledge, almost, you know, 100%, I would say, are Western sources. Even when speakers ended, they ended with Ginrich and uh, of all the people, Gordon Brown, I don't know why. You have extraordinary people in, in Asia and South Asia. I don't know why you have to do that. You have extraordinary poets in Bangladesh who were visionaries like anything, far greater than Ginrich and Gordon Brown. You need to put yourself as a Bangladesh, first, epistemologically. Your sources must go back to the civilization of us. We are an old civilization, very old. We may have, you know, the birth of Bangladesh may be 1971, but the people of this region can go back to 6th century BC, for God's sake. We have republic system of government back in the 6th century BC. In the Lichavi, you know, Lichavi Republic, the oldest, much before the Greeks. And not to mention, Gopal was also an elected king, don't forget. So that is missing. And, and the problem is you need to take advantage of this technology. Whatever I'm saying about the civilizational discourse, of you'll, you'll find it here. There was a foreign policy during the Mughal period. No mention of Akbar, no mention of anyone, as if they did not have a foreign policy, as if they did not use soft power. Who could have used, uh, look at Akbar's gems, the greatest soft power that he has produced and the mighty empire that he created. <laughs> not to mention even the wives, you know. So I would request Bangladesh BISS particularly because it's 44 years. In the beginning, I understand. And I don't blame the young researchers and we are at fault because I say the same thing in our department that we are, our mind is still colonized. We are stuck into that colonial discourse and we can't come out of that. We think either 1947 or 1971, that's it. We, we don't see IR in a much, bigger and holistic way. Bengal was the richest province in 18th century in undivided India. It was the richest province. It is from here where the giraffe went to China. And when Ambassador Li Jimin heard it, he said, yes, Prof, we have records about that in China, that it was Bengal prince who took the giraffe all the way to Beijing or Peking. So my humble request would be, for BSS to address this point seriously. There should be a, a serious colloquium for three, four days on the issue of epistemology. How we can build a Bangladesh-centric epistemology. Otherwise, you cannot take Bangladesh to where you want to take Bangladesh. It is the seventh or eighth largest country in the world, for God's sake. It's not going to vanish anyway. It's not going to go even, even if it goes <laughs> under the Indian Ocean, 
the Indian Ocean will change also. It's 170 million people. There are more Bangladeshis than Russians. Uh, and that's the reason we can take uh, very easily uh, 1.1 million Rohingyas, which is bigger population than Bhutan. Bhutan population is less than 800,000. It took Bhutan to become Bhutan in 60,000 years. And here, in three months, we could at least tackle 1.1 million of Bhutan inside, of greater Bhutan inside Bangladesh, and still surviving. That is missing in the, in, in the discourse. So the technology is important because somebody in the last previous saying about the, somebody raised about the Taiwanese sources. You can always call the Taiwanese. You can talk to the, talk to the journalist. I did the same thing when this height of Pelosi's <laughs> visit and I called uh, and said, Prof, nothing to worry, we are perfectly all right. Don't buy on this uh, Western media. I don't want to tell you stop reading Western media, but I want to tell you read the non-Western media more seriously because media is politics. So whatever you are citing, it's very important. So epistemology is critical. So that's the first thing I think is high time for Bangladesh BISS, for BISS to create an epistemology made. Then Bangladesh BISS will make a difference to foreign policy, to diplomacy, to negotiation. And it was created for this purpose. You know, as I say that I know BISS from day one, literally day one when the gate opened. So it's high time that a serious epistemological bank should be, uh, BIS should be the place where people would come to know about Mughal's foreign policy, Sultan's foreign policy, Barabuya's foreign policy. We had enormous Bay uh, of Bengal trading, you know, I can go on and on on this. That should be revived. This is the place. And there was not a single mention of Chanakko Kotilla. If you take Greater Bengal, he is, a, he is a member of Greater Bengal. Because when we talk Bengal, when we say Bengal, it's always Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa. Bihar and Orissa did not have a separate existence other than within Bengal. It was always the case, historically. It was the British who did this cartographical massacre deliberately and say that a united Bengal is a power divided and it will go in many ways. And I'm quoting the statement of Secretary of State Mayo, Secretary of State uh, Risley, uh, writing to Lord Curzon. So we need to get into that, into that history, to understand what Bangladesh is all about and where do we want. Because there is no reason why, as the seventh or eighth largest country in the world, our body language, our intellectual contribution to the world should not be seventh and eighth largest. That's the point. It's not a small country, and it can never be a small country. There are Bangladeshis everywhere. Name any place in the world, there are, Bangl there are Bengalis. And I'm talking only about Bangladesh. If I, do, if I add the other Bengalis around, then it, it becomes even bigger. So epistemological issues, epistemology first, and then your methodology has to be very you know, innovative and creative. You cannot do with a realist paradigm because it is Eurocentric. By definition, you will not be able to go far. It's based on insecurity. Whole realist discourse, theoretical, is based on insecurity. So you need security, you need arms, you need weapons, you need nuclear weapons. That's what realism is all about. We can't afford to do that. We have a foreign policy principle, which is a fascinating one, friendship towards all, malice towards none. And don't forget it was, you know, charted out first time in 1966, and then officially in 1970 in the Awami League's election manifesto before the birth of Bangladesh by Bangabandhu. That's a fascinating principle. And we have kept it. And we cannot deviate from it, impossible. Because it has a civilizational root of saying friendship towards all malice towards none at a time when 
whole world was in the height of Cold War. Height of Cold War. This new Cold War is nothing. That Cold War absolutely was so rigid, absolutely, absolutely mad. Mutual assured destruction became the buzzword. At that particular time, you know, a genius of Bangladesh, I would say, came up with the idea that friendship towards or marriage towards none. That's what Bengal civilization has always been. We have invited people from all around the world. We still do. We invite to our home, actually. We have a culture of inviting people to our home. Very few cultures have that. They'll take you out to a restaurant, but we invite them at home because we feel that that's what humans are. So my point here is you need to build on that. Now, keeping uh, the epistemology and the mythological issue, I would say you need to go back to Chanako Kotila. And there's no reason why we should not, why we are citing Machiavelli and Morgenthu, I don't understand at all. They don't know Bengal, they don't know Bangladesh. Probably they haven't heard. Well, Machiavelli had no, probably had heard, but <laughs> it doesn't matter to him. It's almost like I'm trying to fix the foreign policy of Italy. How can I do that? It's impossible. So we need to see, and BSS is the best place to do it. This is a research center which actually can really build on it, bring people, even on a part time basis, historians, you know, musicians, poets, to see what kind of epistemology that would allow foreign policy makers think differently and make Bangladesh a great country. That's, that's the point I'm trying to use. The second one coming out of this, uh, you know, uh, if I want to use uh, Chanukko's uh, diplomacy, he was more into what he was a dialectician and using the South Asian dialectics called Prashungika. And Prashungika is, is an interesting way. If, like, if I can translate that, it would be theory of contemporaneous. He, he always wanted to see, look at the contemporary and then build on it with a circle of space, not circle of state. That was, wrongly, um, that was wrongly translated and wrongly used by the realist. Because there was no state. This very idea of enemies, a state, you know, enemies friend, you know, in, in terms of state doesn't make sense because there was no state during Chanako Kotila's time in the Westphalian sense of the word. So there was a circle of space. And this circle of space was Mandola. If you have visited Nepal, you'd see all design in Mandola. That's, that's what Chanako was trying to do. So in foreign policy, you need to have all the circles, the political, the economic, uh, cultural, the psychological, name anything, and all the cycles ought to be there. And that would, what, that would create the kind of diplomacy that is required, the kind of professionalism that is required. So what do we do with the contemporaneous that we have today? 2022, I'm talking. Just one or two, and I'll stop. The first contemporaneous that one has to flag, and this has not, at least I did not hear so much, the world is moving towards a multipolarity, and there is no way to stop it. There is no way to stop this multipolarity, and this is for the first time the world is going to see a multipolar world. Multipolarity was there in Europe to some extent, in South Asia, in Africa, in regionally. But there was never a multipolarity on a global scale. You had unipolarity with Pax Britannica. Then after Second World War, you had a bipolar world. And with Gorbachev, you know, saying thank you very much, no more. Uh, the world went back to unipolarity for a while. Pax Americana. And one can easily see you cannot sustain Pax Americana. It's simple as that. I think Afghan war has clearly, Taliban have really shown that that's not possible. And so they have left. And now they're trying their best actually to keep this in a polarity. The West is thinking what will happen with this multipolar world. There's so much, I guess, uh, attention, a panic for the West thinking what would be this multipolar. But you cannot stop the re-rise of China or re-rise of India or re-rise of Brazil. There are re-rise. Because they were, you know, 
big powers back in the 18th century and earlier. China was the largest economy in the 18th century, the largest economy in the world in 18th century. They lost out only 200 years. It's the rise of China. India, undivided India, sorry, undivided India was the second largest economy in the world, contributing 22% of GDP. And in the undivided India, Bengal was the richest province. So these are all rewrites. So if it is a rewrite, you can see this multipolarity. You, can, you cannot stop with the globalization. People looking at this uh, technology knows, you know, look at the relationship between the people are worried and you know, the people are surprised about our relationship with, with, uh, with uh, uh, the World Cup Argentinians. It's nothing to be surprised. Because virtually, we are very close to it. Yes, physically we are far, but that physical distance is no longer there. Virtually, we are actually, in, you know, just a screen apart. So we know what Argentina looks like. Earlier, we used to know uh, Latin America through Che Guevara to begin with. You know, Che was one of those big, uh, and of course, uh, uh, Gabriel Marquez, you know, 100 years of solitude. If you have read that, so Marquis was one of those, Quintus was other, through literature, mainly through literature and particularly, you know, novel and, and poetry. And then, of course, Che Guevara was also very important, Fidel Castro, etc. But now you don't need that because you, you can interact with, you know, so, you know, you, you know them just on the screen. You can talk to them even when I'm speaking now or when you're speaking now. If an Argentinian wants to listen to me, they can listen to me. If it is, you know, live stream, they can even listen the word Argentina, you know, spoken in BSS. So multipolarity ought to have, you know, been flagged in this discourse uh, of the last section and first section because that's that's something that you can't because that's going to impact upon the climate diplomacy. Because if you have a multipolar world, you can easily see you are not going to get. Somebody was saying, "How many cops do you need? <laughs> 27, 28, because it will be endless. Because you are not going to. You are not. You are, it's not a, the unipolar world is, is collapsed. You are not going to have that. You are going to have uh, negotiate on the multipolar level, and you need more professionalism for that matter, not less professionalism. Because as I said, nobody knows our multipolar world. So with unipolar and bipolar, we are more or less we know what to do. Diplomats also knew what to do uh, in a bipolar world. And unipolar was even easier. But a multipolar world, what kind of language are you going to say? What kind of dress are you going to wear? Are you going to wear the Western dress? Or are you going to wear the Chinese dress or the Japanese dress? The whole lot you have to think about your professionalism. The diplomats have a long kind of, you know, <laughs> uh, a serious night to think even to what to eat and what not to eat, because you are living in a multipolar world and it has to be that you are negotiating with all these polars simultaneously. So juggling with eight or 10 balls is much more difficult than juggling with one or two balls. That's the point I'm saying. So your diplomacy and negotiation ought to be, there. and BISS ought to be the training place of this multipolarity, because it is coming. There's no way to stop it. So what should happen? in the future, what kind of professionalism we require, what kind of training we would require, what, what would be the manuals that would be required, what is the study pack that would be required in this multipolar world. We would need Chinese sources as much as Korean sources, as much as Japanese sources. We can't depend on one source because that will distort the reality. I'm not trying to tell you that throw away Morgan Fu, believe it or not. I'm not trying to tell you throw away Tiffany. No, no, no. You read them, but at the same time, you must know the Kissinger of China and the Morgenthau of China or Japan and South Korea and even Singapore. I just came uh, from Singapore uh, two days back and they are very keen on the FTA. And they were saying, Prof, this is, too, this is a relationship that will not go wrong in any way because we are only 5.6 million people. We can never threaten 170 million people. So <laughs> this would be the best FTA uh, one can think about. Uh, that, that's a good way of looking at it, you know, 5.6 million and 170 million. So here is a 5.6 million eager to have an FTA with Bangladesh. Man, I think, you know, 
it's worth looking into it seriously and, and see what we need to and do. Given the fact there is an enormous professionalism in Singapore, it's enormous, and I can go on and on on my experience of one, seven weeks uh, interacting with them. Uh, one can easily see how they have built their professionalism. The second and, the, uh, and, and probably the last one is the youth was relatively missing. And I guess it is missing because we are still trapped into American dream or some other dreams. We need to have Bangladesh dream. You cannot build a country without dreams. You know, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Descartes. I think, therefore, I am. And I trans. I change that into say, no, I dream, therefore I am. I am. Because humans are the only one who can dream. Well, we don't know about the cows and the dogs, whether they dream or not, but we are the only ones who dream and can materialize the dream. So we need Bangladesh dream to attract young people in two ways. One, to keep them in Bangladesh to begin with, and there will be Bangladesh is going out. You can't stop that also. But to engage them with Bangladesh in a way so that even if they're outside, and this is where the diaspora comes, the diaspora can get engaged in this Bangladesh dream uh, project. Now, what could be the Bangladesh dream? I'll just give one, there are X number of dreams. I, I presented uh, something at the Foreign Service Academy uh, when Foreign Secretary requested me to do so. So I said, why not? Look at the Bangladesh dream on the issue of infrastructure. Bangladesh can change the entire geography that we have today with only six high-speed trains. You need only six high-speed trains. The government has started to think about Bangladesh, sorry, Dhaka to Chiragong high-speed train, not in the way that I would be presenting you now, uh, because they're thinking there are more people going to Chiragong and Dhaka, so let's have a high-speed train. No. If you have six high-speed trains connected to all the eight divisions, headquarters, you can change the entire geography because you will not need anywhere to go beyond one hour. So Sirat would be one hour, Rangpur one hour. So the Siratis don't have to stay in Dhaka. All the students that you have in Dhaka University they can so and then just go and go back to Silet and stay in their village or in their own city and develop that city. Because now what is happening, they have to leave Silet, come here, you know, and and city is, is, is really you know, expensive and it doesn't work. So you need eight high-speed trains. So six high-speed trains to connect eight, uh, eight uh, headquarters and you can change. At the same time, simultaneously, you need 64 center of excellence in 64 districts, not in all in Dhaka, only 64. You need 64 comprehensive, comprehensive hospitals in 64 districts because you would be connected with the high-speed train. So the infrastructure, the dream, can also take you to the second dream of health. That's also one area. Education is the other area. You can, of course, uh, agriculture would be another dream uh, of how you transform agriculture. There has been some development on that. And maritime hub would be the other one, uh, the dream. And also, I would say the culture, uh, the culture engagement with the youth also, because you need festivals everywhere, every month. If you want to reduce what is the influence of fundamentalists, of whatever the kind, because there are, there are all kinds of fundamentalists. So the, the best way is your soft power that you have civilizationally. It is not Joseph Nye who taught us of soft power. Read Rabindranath Tagore, 36 volumes the fellow has written, and bulk of it is on soft power. <laughs> this is how you look at it in the world. So bulk of it, you know, is, is volumes. Poetry is only three volumes, three to four volumes. Bulk of it is social science, but nobody, many of the poetry is also soft power. So, so my point here is, uh, I guess this Bangladesh dream is required. And of course, 
those who have gone, they are meritorious people. You know, you can't blame them, uh, you know, the children that they have gone. Uh, the only thing is that we have to connect them with Bangladesh. That is how what Deng Xiaoping did with China. Because when he was asked this simple question, you know, somebody said, look, you are letting all these young Chinese, meritorious Chinese go everywhere. You know, what will happen to China? And he said, no, 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 they will come back. And he said, how can you, why will they come back? He said, no, by the time they will finish the studies, we'll, we'll develop our infrastructure. We'll give them the dream. Well, Xi Jinping has already made a Chinese dream, but actually is based more on Deng Xiaoping. This is the combination of capitalism and communism, capi communism. That's what he learned from Lee Kuan Yew, Deng Xiaoping. So my point here is we need a Bangladesh dream to get the youth of the engage and which place can be the flagship of all these? BISS. BISS can make a difference immensely. And since very soon it's going to become 50 years itself, I think more you invest on this on these issues and make a change in, in a serious way with research and all, I believe uh, a greater contribution, not that it has not contributed, it has contributed immensely, but uh, a far more, uh, you know, a bigger contribution because sometimes we, we talk about some think tanks in Norway, some think tanks in, in the US and all. I guess this is one think tank. Let it not go slip away by colonized thinking. Rather, let us have our own thinking, our own ways of looking at it. And the best way is to develop an epistemology that is Bangladesh centered. Thank you very much. Thank you all for speakers. Sorry, I, you know, it's not midnight, but thank you very much. No, th th thank you, uh, uh, Professor Imtiaz, but I just want a, a little bit of assurance for our IR student that whether they will uh, be uh, graded A and A plus without uh, quoting Morgenthau and Joseph Nye. If you can assure them, I'm sure <laughs> they would look more into uh, Chanika and, uh, and Thank you very much. Thank you.